Welcome to another exciting episode of the Collect and Destroy podcast. I'm your host, the Baxter of Puppets. If you've ever dreamed of be, if you've ever been in a band, if you've ever dreamed of being in a band, if you've ever listened to a band, then we've got a movie and a backstage pass for you. Today, we will be stage diving headfirst into the 1994 hard rock, heavy metal, cult classic, Airheads. My guest today is one of my longtime brothers in metal. He's got questionable taste in sports teams. He <laughs> wants your skull. He's Hoffman, Hoff Machine. Ken Hoffman, welcome to the show. What's up, Baxter? That was that was pretty good, man. Uh, good to see you, brother. <laughs> good to be back here. It's been a it's while. I don't think you and I have done this since like before Christmas. No, I think the last one was Nightmare. We didn't. No, it was Vacation. Oh yeah, vacation, the holiday, holiday yeah. episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, how's uh, how's twenty twenty one treating you? More the same. Um, I got my first uh, COVID shot yesterday, so that's good. All right. Um, you know, I was actually psyched to do that and get that done, and uh, I encourage everybody to do that. Um, other than that, man, just trying to plug along, keep busy with work. You know, through the Hey Ken, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Your uh, your mic went out for a second there. Yeah, I think I hit the mute button by accident when I got all excited and spoke with my hands. <laughs> so you're uh, you're vaccinated. You're ready to get back at it. How's work uh -huh. going? Uh, works good. You know, um, my my work is it's an ebb and flow. So I have either like I'm super busy or I'm not. So um, when I'm not busy, I'm trying to keep occupied with. You know, skull making and uh, I'm looking at investment properties right now with Tiffany, you know, sort of as a as a way to invest some money and a little bit of a side hustle, that kind of thing. So I've always got something brewing, you know. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Something I always like to touch on with our guest is kind of, uh, you know, what we've been watching, reading, whatever. Mm -hmm. Any good shows you can recommend? Any good movies? Uh, yeah. You know, where are we at? We're. I'm still on The Sopranos um, now, oh, yeah. season five, um, which is still so like an amazing, still an amazing show. Actually, the more I watch it, the more I really appreciate the acting on that. Gandolfini's yeah. acting, Edie Falco's acting is so good. And concurrently, while watching that, I'm listening to Talking Sopranos, nice um, Steve Sarippa and Michael Imperioli, which is um, Bobby Bacala. And Christopher Moltisanti, they have a, a podcast where they go through the episodes one by one and they bring guests on and talk about behind the scenes and the making of it and that experience. And that's pretty rad. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that if you could sort of sync them together. But um, yeah, on, on Netflix or HBO, I mean, Disney, we got a lot of stuff that we're watching, I guess. Um I watched the last blockbuster documentary. Oh, that was so good. Cool. So good. That took me back. I think that's like a good fit for our podcast here. You know, it's like the nostalgia. That that movie really kind of had me walk in memory lane a little bit. I, wa I we watched that movie while I was prepping for this podcast. So right. I'm like, I just got even more amped about the whole right. concept of VHS and rentals and uh, you know, late night. You know, there wasn't a single birthday party I went to when you wouldn't have like random three vhs movies that they picked up with their parents and right. some of it may be questionable for children like in fourth grade when we watched it and it too like right i i never seen a horror movie in my life and the first exposure is that and i think people were like asleep and i'm just sitting there under my sleeping bag and learning about uh stephen king the, and <laughs> <laughs> that that movie just you know as always, it's like the people behind the scenes that are the story too. So that touches yeah. on, you know, it pulls all your emotions. Um, but you know, we, we're like documentary lovers and true crime fans. So I'm watching the staircase right now. I don't know if you've seen this. Okay. This, is, this is about a dude who, um, uh, called in 911 and said his wife fell down the stairs and, you know, hit her head and died. Um, and then they came and they said, no, you pushed her down the stairs. No, you actually, she had like seven lacerations on her head. And then it turns out that um, a woman from in his life 20 years earlier befell the same fate. So two women in his life accidentally fell down the stairs and died. 
So there's that whole thing. Um, and it's like the, the, the cameras are with the lawyer, um, his defense team, you know, behind the scenes documenting the whole thing. Uh, and it's 13 episodes long. So it is long. So there is clearly like a twist and we've hit the twist. I won't give spoilers out to it, but um, that's pretty interesting uh, viewing if you like that kind of stuff. And then um, one other thing that we saw, which was really cool, was did you see did you see the one? It's it's a British show. It's no. basically like um, it's kind of like in the world of like um, uh, you know online dating, you know Tinder and Bumble and that kind of stuff. But it's DNA coding. So they'll like if you put if you put it's like twenty three and Me meets up with Tinder. So they will find your genetic. Your your soulmate, you're actually genetically matched to somebody, <laughs> um, and if you choose to go, you know, get that service, and then what that sort of befalls, because there's like you know people still meet organically, but then like sort of how that can either create or destroy relationships, and it's a uh, eight part, I think it's eight shows, um, and it's British. So I really am enjoying like foreign stuff that's popping up on Netflix, like. That the um, 30 what was coins. that Spanish one that you recommended? 30, to me? Thirty coins, man. Yeah, thirty coins. I'm kind of I'm kind of getting away from the Hollywood machine a little bit now that I'm exposed. Netflix allows you to be exposed to it, and I dig all these like foreign movies and foreign and foreign TV shows. So that was there's a good definitely one. there's definitely a different style, you know. Yeah, like for sure. like Nate and I were talking about thirty coins, how it it moves so fast that by the third episode, it felt like an entire season. And just just really good writing, and I think it's really that it's show moved super. It's fast. just like reading. It's important to switch authors, switch from fiction to nonfiction. Just switch it up and try something new. Um, yeah. You know, award season is upon us. We just watched uh, Sound of Metal. I don't know if you. Yeah, it's in my it's in my my list. I haven't watched it yet. Is that speaking of metal movies? Is that a good one? Yeah, it's great. Uh, very, very good. Um, honestly, the scariest movie I've seen this year, and not because it's a horror movie, but uh, it's no secret that the movie is about a heavy metal drummer who loses his hearing. Yeah. And uh, as a musician, you know, a metal musician, like uh, it, it, it just really is freaky. And then I, I had a, a situation myself a number of years ago where I'd gone to a hate breed concert mm -hmm. and for one week after that, I had ringing, I had like the, like water in the ear sensation. Yeah. Um, so, uh, that since that point, which was probably maybe 10 years ago, uh, or even longer, uh, always earplugs. I always wear earplugs because I, if that sensation would have stayed permanent, uh, that'd be a nightmare, which is a lot of what this movie deals with. <clears throat> great, great acting. Um, great uh uh in, in relationships i guess within the film so it's kind of weird that a a movie about a heavy metal drummer would actually make it to the you know grand stage of the academy awards like that so mm -hmm. on the surface i'm like what's so special about this movie that it could make it there and then after seeing it, it all made sense and yeah. great acting you know i've never really had issues with hearing despite going to shows my whole life and and basically since i got my first walkman in like middle school having some sort of earphones or earbuds or earplugs sure. in you know um basically my whole life i mean there's not a day go by a day day that goes by now where i don't have them in whether i'm working out or talking on the phone or whatnot so um i'm surprised that that hasn't happened to me but i have come home from shows like particularly like I remember coming home from a ministry show, which was probably the loudest I've ever been where sure. you, I would lie in bed and the ringing was so loud that I couldn't sleep, you know? Uh, and I was like, I hope, but it, but it always, it always faded. It never lasted for a week. So now it's been scary. So let's, uh, let's, uh, Oh, quickly, before we jump into the movie, yeah. uh, sculpable, any updates? Uh, uh, what's going on with your skull making uh, business? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, well, I guess the last time we talked was Christmas time. So, you know, I sold a bunch at Christmas time that I was really excited about. Sold them all through like Facebook and Instagram um, and then got really focused on the branding portion of it and <clears throat> worked on the logo and and starting to like uh, make some marketing assets. And then I built a whole 
Etsy website for it, you know, hoping that it would go a little bit more viral. And sure, I sold yeah. one through Etsy. And then like two weeks ago, the uh, uh, copyright police came after me and uh, shut it down. So uh, which I kind of expected to, to, yeah. to be honest. But um, and since the only, since I only sold one, I really wasn't heartbroken. I mean, I knew that they were a little bit of, of a bootleg item, but it's art, you know. So yeah. um, it's forced me to sort of walk the uh, licensing route. And I've and I've done some research on it. I mean, uh, to, to even play in the game, you got to pay one hundred thousand dollars per year to the NFL just to get the licensing rights. Um, so that's wow. a pretty big investment. Not sure if I'll ever get to that point, but dare to dream. <laughs> um, for now, I think I'll just continue to do like my bootleg art and sell it, you know, to uh, through the social media outlets. And sure. um, I've been working on a baseball one for like months and I'm just not happy with it and I keep redoing it. Um, but I think it's going to be cool when it's done. So sure. um, the football ones, I think, are really seasonal. And if the season's over, nobody's really interested in it. So I'm trying to focus on another sport. But um, thanks for asking, man. That's sort of the state of the union right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, good luck with that. Uh, it's kind of weird because when you go to Etsy, you search for like Green Bay Packers. There's all sorts of artists making so stuff. So much shit. So maybe I'll take it I'm as sure a compliment. Um, I'm sure their legal department, though, is just like, sending out those letters it wasn't and... even them it was actually like an agency on their behalf interesting so okay. it's like a security agency who that's that's their job is to like hunt down licensing infringement and like shut it down on the nfl's behalf so i take it as a compliment they were just threatened by my amazing work that they were <laughs> like we got to nip this in the bud before before he comes a becomes a force of nature but <laughs> um because <laughs> like you said there is so much stuff on etsy yeah. But I wasn't about to like rename the page and like redo it. You know, I was like, I'm not going to do that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever, man. Uh, well, let's uh, let's dive into things. Yeah, um, dude. Airheads is the reason we're here. It's a 1994 American hard rock and heavy metal comedy film written by R Rich Wilkes and directed by Michael Lehman. In the movie, three aspiring rock musicians, Chaz, played by Brendan Fraser, Pitt, played by Adam Sandler, and Rex, played by Steve Buscemi, are striving for rock and roll success and a record deal for their L.A. band, The Lone Rangers. The clearest path to make these dreams come true is to have their demo played on the air. Out of desperation, they sneak into a Los Angeles radio station, KPPX, Rebel Radio. But when the manager, Milo, played by Michael McKean, meets them with hostility, they resort to threatening him with realistic-looking water pistols. Soon the situation escalates and the none too bright rockers get in <clears throat> over their heads. Sounds like many uh, experiences you and I have had already. But um, with that all being said, when did you first see Airheads? What are your earliest memories of the film? And even what are some of your takeaways from watching it most recently? Yeah. Uh, what year was this? 94, right? 94. Yeah, so that puts me as a freshman in college. When this came out, um, I think I was too involved on the bong team at that time to be going to like concerts or, or to go to be going to movies. You know, I I don't really have an early memory of the to be of the movie to be honest with you. I remember it kind of coming out, but um, I don't think it got a lot of fanfare, a lot of advertising. I think it bombed in the box office, if I remember. Um, and so. It wasn't until like years later that I even remember seeing it. And I don't know if I saw sure. it because somebody rented it. It was probably something that we rented and watched. But it wasn't really until recently where you were like, hey, you want to explore this movie? And I was like, oh, that's that Brendan Fraser, Buscemi movie, right? And so rewatching it for this podcast was really my, um, you know, uh, reintroduction to it again on like on. Sure. And, I, and I remembered some things, but then I remember which I think maybe are more classic things, but like uh a lot of it was really fresh and new for me yeah i think like so many movies that we cover have that kind of story i mean the thing and we in on the thing podcast we referenced blade runner both of those were box office bombs and then later through vhs through rental people start getting invested in it cable tv obviously plays a huge role in cult movies mm -hmm. 
Um, my earliest memories, so 1994, let me set you the scene. I'm 12 years old. I'm going to a birthday party. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, that was the thing we would rent movies or maybe, you know, your friend has cable. So there's some movies on that you, that I didn't have at home cause I didn't have cable. But, um, so I remember seeing that at, at his birthday party. Um, I was instantly hooked. I was like, oh, this is, fu it's funny, you know, funny to a 12 year old, um, it's rock and roll. Um, I'm seeing White Zombie perform for the first time on the big stage here on, at the Whiskey in that scene. Um, White Zombie is probably one of the things that is like one of my biggest takeaways from that. I would put them as one of my top 10 favorite all-time bands. Mm -hmm. So to have something show up in such an interesting way like that, but it wasn't just the sound, but it was the visuals like Rob... Rob like looked like something I had never seen before in a musician. He just had this aura and the band and, you know, Sean's playing bass with the neon yellow hair. Um, oh, wait. So this movie introduced you to white zombie. They introduced me. I, I, oh. I don't recall. I, I could be wrong. Maybe I heard him on the radio or right. something, but I remember like being swept up in the fever. I mean, again, 1994, I got swept up in that, that fever of, white zombie and if i could be mistaken but i think at the time they weren't as big of a band like yeah. as commercially successful as they had become right. with a lot of movies you know the bigger bands don't necessarily want to be in a hollywood movie right um so securing those bands before they become you know uh humongous well, bands uh, thunder kiss had only come out like three years before that i think like 91 ish i know it came out in my high school and this you know and I, I graduated in 93 so it was somewhere around that time and yeah i don't think that was the album that put them on the map but i don't think they had blown up but that totally explains why you wanted to do this movie because it's your zombie fetish that you're like hey it goes back through <laughs> this that's what it well, is and, and i think with any movies that you hold dear it's those kind of movies that you grew up with so right. whereas right. you were you were in college at the time you were in interested in other things. You were swept up in other things. Um, for me, I had all that time from 12 to 18, you know, that mm -hmm. six years are very formative years of your youth. Mm -hmm. And when all you're dreaming about is being in a band, playing music, rock and roll, figuring out who you are. Um, this obviously is like a, um, a roadmap for a young Baxter. Mm -hmm. um, so just kept, kept, popping up i love the plot it's it was funny but it was serious it was <clears throat> it just had a good it has a good flow from start to finish like yeah. it feels like a complete movie when they get to the end you're like a nice bow on the top mm -hmm. um ra wrapped it up um and 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 the other thing that i think we can both attest to is the cast of this movie is stellar like all these actors are are very famous now now i think unintentionally time, it was it was unintentionally stellar yeah i mean i i had said um you know before we got on the air we were talking a little bit and it was if you're a good actor that comes through whether it's your beginning films where it's nobody sees the movie right. or it's a movie now winning an academy award you're going to be a good actor you're a good musician Usually that follows you from your entire career. Um, so regardless of how well the movie went over, at the time people were like, oh, it's a bunch of no nobodies that were in some indie films or whatever. Um, now the thought of Adam Sandler being in a movie is like big box office boom, you know? People <laughs> well, I was just about to ask you, I'm like, so you're saying Brendan Fraser is a good actor? <laughs> uh, I would I would say so. I mean, I think The Mummy is pretty good, man. All like, right. uh but so let, i mean let's let's jump into the cast a little uh -huh. bit i mean we have we have brendan fraser who you just mentioned right and at this time he had only been in encino man which he had like <laughs> right. no lines in he's only in a caveman right. and uh he's playing Chaz darby aka chester ogilvy mm -hmm. um he's the lead guitarist and lead vocalist of the lone rangers he's pretty big-hearted dude he's committed to rock and roll um he's getting kicked out by his girlfriend because he can't get signed but he can't bring himself to get a real job and uh he describes his band as power slop um what i found interesting about this character is originally they were talking about john cusack playing this role 
which I see it being a completely different movie. Totally if you different movie. Yeah. cast John Cusick. I mean, reference like high fidelity. I don't know if I could visualize that. I could see like Matt Dillon doing it, but you know, yeah, not John yeah, Cusack. You got- yeah, Cusack. I mean, I think that's just a carryover of thinking of like the movies that Cusack was in in the 80s. They're mm-hmm. trying to make a similar type of movie. But uh, I think they I think they struck gold by going with the Brennan Fraser type character. He kind of embodies that role. Yeah, this is Brennan Fraser before he was like totally ripped for the mummy. <clears throat> yeah. But yep. Um, yep. his sidekick was uh, Steve Buscemi, uh, who was the bass player Rex. Um, Rex, I think they was actually modeled after uh, Rex Brown, who was the actual basis of Pantera at the time. And um, uh, Pantera was like in 94 was really starting to come into their own. They kind of owned metal at that time. So if you actually look at the two of them together, he looks a lot like him, like his goatee sort of shaped like him. His hair is very much like him. So apparently one of the he was one of the influences for this character, but uh, he's like the perfect wingman. You know, he's like you, you definitely he is always that's the basis in the band at all times. He's got like the Thor tattoo. He works at the toy store. You know, he's the one who's like, yeah, let's put like chili powder in the water pistols and shoot him in the <laughs> eye. Like he's got all the scheming going on. So like that's the perfect role for him, for Steve Buscemi. Um, and Buscemi wasn't a huge actor at the time. He'd become a huge, but he did. Ha- he was Mr. Pink in Reservoir Dogs before this film. So he was starting to like establish himself as as awesome. Yeah, I think Steve was like in so many movies, and you'd be like, "Oh, it's that guy," because he has yeah. such a distinct look, like right. and his voice and his style. Um, so he was one of those actors where I think he hit all at once, where people discovered him. They're like, they see him in Lebowski and then they watch all the movies that go back in time. So then you're watching Reservoir Dogs, you're watching Airheads. Um, Another character who was really relatively unknown other than like being in Saturday Night Live was Adam Sandler. Yeah. And what, what I really appreciate about him in this movie is prior, I mean, later as his career goes on, every Adam Sandler movie is an Adam Sandler movie, Um, which in my opinion everything after Billy Madison just gets a little less good as time goes on. Like to me, that was like the Adam Sandler movie. It's great. Mm -hmm. Um, But in this movie, he, you know, he plays Pip the drummer. Uh, He's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. He adds a lot of comedy. He's got a lot of great one liners. He's got a sweet half shirt. Um, He's got his cut off flannel shirt, which I was very tempted to wear something like that today. (laughs) Like, (laughs) <laughs> and uh he runs pip's pool service i mean what, right. what, how much more can you ask for well he like you mentioned like he, he starts at his he's not adam sandler yet the movie star but like his character is very much the model of what his mo- is what his characters are in the rest of his career which is like sure kind of the dumb guy with like the one-liners mm-hmm. and like you know the mannerisms so this role really sort of starts what's accentuated for the rest of his career and he made a ton of money off of that you know absolutely um, uh in the shark he's the dj at uh kppx i was played by uh joe montagna who's another one of these guys who's been like in everything you know you look yeah. at that face you're like oh i know that cat but um you might not know his name um in this he's like you know He's the quintessential DJ at the time, which you have to remember in 94, like radio was a huge outlet, really the only outlet outside of TV, yeah. outside of MTV for for success of bands. And I think he does a good job of playing that. Um, but this guy was before Airheads. He was in Godfather 3. He was in The Money Pit. He was in uh, Three Amigos. He was in Hair on Broadway. Like the guy had a career. So arguably like one of the bigger stars in the movie if you didn't even know his name now but um i like um, that's what makes a cool career i think i love his line the station with more hair more flair so debonair i you had mentioned about the radio dj and the importance of radio and radio djs were like celebrities like your local DJ was sure. not just somebody. They had been in that role for 10 plus years. Everybody knew them. If you were in a band, you just wanted to get that your tape to them right. so that you could like rub elbows. And, and I feel like 
uh, being a radio DJ is like not held to the same level. Like it's much more disposable nowadays. I think unless you're like a celebrity DJ, you're doing something like on satellite radio or something mm-hmm. like that. <clears throat> Jose Mangan or something. Well, there's few of them, but there's very few of them. You're right. Back then that was a big thing. Those guys held stature and now it's just like, podcasters like you and me are at that level of celebrity but uh radio <laughs> djs are just not you know <laughs> well it was so it was so regional right like right. your radio right. was right. the reach of your city it maybe it's a neighboring city um but now with like the advent of like the internet and satellite radio and all this like this podcast is global you know it's we've got listeners in australia and england and the the the, that stuff shows up on the streaming charts that we look at and it's really cool to see that you have that reach but back then it was just regional it was just your city and maybe maybe you could get the station to come in that was like another city away if you just held your radio just the right way you had to be on the cusp you had to live on the border though yeah exactly um, so another, uh, I would actually categorize this guy's a, a freaking legend at yeah, this he, point. He's the biggest name in the movie, actually. Michael McKean is Milo Jackson, the KPPX uh, station manager. Uh, what a character! He's got that. He's got that classic, um, classic ponytail. Um, I thought the funny thing about this station. Some of the audio issues, I think, Ryan. It's clear now, it sounds like. You're muted. Can you hear me? No, I got it. You're good. All right. Sorry about that, I folks. Clean that up. Uh, so I think one of the interesting things about this character is Milo is secretively planning to change the format of the radio station mm-hmm. um, to this easy listening uh, sound and... Um, just he he just embodies this role so much and i can remember even as a 12 year old thinking like there couldn't be a better person to play this role and his his resume though i mean he was lenny on laverne and shirley uh he's in all the christopher guest films yes obviously david st hubbins from spinal Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, most recently chuck mcgill on the on better call saul which is like such a phenomenal show did he 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 is a legend and arguably the biggest name in this movie at the time and at this time too looked exactly like bob rock who is a producer of the the black album for metallica so he nailed the part perfectly yeah and the cops uh chris farley and ernie hudson uh this is another like breakout role really uh farley was on snl but sort of like sandler was in a small bit part before this, he was in Coneheads. Uh, but just when you see him, I mean, he's like the bumbling cop as only Farley can do. And, you know, when I watched this movie again, it just reminded me like what a unique talent he was, like a unique physical talent. Because just when he like appears on screen, you laugh. Just like when he's, he's lying on the ground and he jumps up, you laugh. Like his physical mannerisms are just um, like bar none. Uh, and what a real, what a loss it was to, 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 you know, lose a guy like that. But, uh, and Ernie Hudson played sort of like the other cop, like the good cop, Ernie Hudson being Winston Zedmore and Ghostbusters. So he had those two movies under his belt. Um, he's had a pretty long career. Um, if you look at his IMDB, but I don't really recall much of seeing him much after this movie. So I think like while airheads sort of launched the career, a lot of people, it kind of killed the career of Ernie Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he was in, he was in Congo. I remember that after this. Oh, okay, oh, oh. which is a much better book than movie. But um, yeah, when you talk about Chris Farley's talent, I mean, I yeah. I think of three guys in the same regard, which would be Belushi, John Candy, Chris Farley, like. Yeah all kind of a similar thing uh two of them died the same way like Mm -hmm. which is very it's very sad and it's the same story it's like 
there was so much more to give so much more this gift that they had that no one else has. Um, but classic, classic Chris Farley yeah. and a very big part of the nineties. Uh, Amy Locaine is, is in this film as Kayla, who's Chaz's girlfriend. She kicks him out for basically being a jobless loser. Um, <laughs> She's she's like the quintessential <clears throat> 90s rock chick, you know. Insert she's, hot blonde here. Yeah. She's responsible, got the job, but she's also like wearing like leopard print and mm -hmm. a choker. And um, you know, she plays a pretty key role in this film because she's the only one with the backup copy of the demo <laughs> uh for the band. So they need her essentially. Judd Nelson played uh, Jimmy Wing. He was a record executive, um, you know, and he and he carries that like swarmy, like you know, ego around with him. He's got like the soul patch, and you know, so he plays that role really well. Another guy that was huge before this, he was Saint Elmo's Fire and the Breakfast Club, which is amazing. But then I feel like he's in the Ernie Hudson camp. Like I don't really recall him after Airheads in no. anything. Um, other than I think he had a t he was on TV for a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, su suddenly Susan, I think, with Brooke Shields. Okay, yeah, I, see, I don't even remember that. Like, I, but uh, <clears throat> that was it. I don't know what he did. I'm I'm sure he had a career after that. But like this, you know, did it, Airheads launched everybody, but killed Judd and Ernie, man. So it's kind of um, like uh, Sean Penn. It's like yeah. where did Spicoli go? Like, <laughs> you got this like character and then he becomes mm -hmm. something totally different and in yeah. this case you you've got john bender from the breakfast club and he evolves into essentially this douche like i, I and i don't know that in real life he was a douche i'm just saying like the roles he took he went from the epitome of cool to jimmy wing <laughs> i guess it just kind of shows you how hard it is to have staying power in hollywood man you know yeah yeah well, and, and, and maybe, maybe it's because he wasn't really that persona that he put on the screen. Maybe he tried to get away from that persona mm -hmm. that he put on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Nina Samasco, who, uh, who plays, um, what's her name? Lizzie? Uh, Susie. Susie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Susie. So um, she's an employee of KPPX. Um, she essentially falls for Pip. She's kind of the way that they get into the radio station. Right. They're trying to like pick the electronic lock, which is actually funny because they put in a Pip's debit card and then it <laughs> eats his debit card. Um, but she's going out for a smoke, accidentally hits Pip in the head. Um, and it's kind of like a, a kind of a sweet way that they meet. And that's how right. the boys sneak their way into the radio station. <clears throat> Uh, Marshall Bell played Carl Mace. He was like the neurotic cop. He's told, or, or, or the head of the SWAT team. And he's a total loose cannon. Um, <laughs> he's just obsessed with, um, his, like his wife leaving him who ironically left him for, you know, having an affair with the pool guy. So once he finds out that there's like a pool truck out there, <laughs> the pool service, he like loses it. And I think this is had built the vendetta, you know, to get these guys, um, this is an actor I don't know much about. I think he was in Starship Troopers, like as a general, but, um, like, but he's got a familiar face maybe just because I just watched the movie, but I remember looking at it and I'm like, oh, I kind of know this guy. You've seen him. He's been in things, but always like as a supporting role. Yeah. I think he just kind of helps the story along. You yeah. know, he helps. Mm -hmm. It's one of those roles that like not a major role, but just enough to keep things interesting. Um, Speaking of recognizing a face, um, but there's actually a third cop in this movie, um, Alan Covert plays. Hmm. Uh, and Alan Covert, it's the one where uh, uh, Pip's going outside and they're kind of like miming each other walking outside. Right. Um, but Alan Covert, he's the star of Grandma's Boy. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that movie. I've but that's that. another classic cult. That's a good one. Kind of went under the radar and then blew up later. Um, but he ends up being in other Adam Sandler movies down the road, but it's kind of, it's always kind of nice when you see a guy and you're like, wow, I definitely didn't realize that when I was 16, but now right. I like can recognize him immediately. Yeah. 
Uh, Reggie Kathy plays Marcus. He's another KPPX uh, radio station employee. He's a guitar playing, powerful and proud black man. He speaks out about the plight of his people and adds an element of social awareness to the film. So even though it's kind of through in the 90s, it, the way to do that was to like make it comedy. So mm -hmm. we're going to make fun of the white man and and the plight of the black man and push these things. But it's also a way of putting a spotlight on societal issues like racism and sexism. Um, it should be noted, um, Rod, the Rodney King beating was three years prior to this film. Yeah. So in, this, in the public's eye, the social consciousness, the stuff was very fresh. Yeah. Um, so well, there's definitely some social commentary in this movie, you know, some direct, some indirect, um, sort of how they, and, and how they portray it is interesting. Um, yeah. Mostly it's done through comedy. Uh, we'll probably get into it when we talk about, you know, it's when we go in depth a little bit, but you know, uh, <clears throat> there's always like the character who embodies that. And that was him, you know? Yeah. Good, good character helps diversify the cast a yeah. bit. Um, David Arquette, who, um, does he do anything after this movie? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I think he, I think he did two movies. I think he did scream. And then I think he's a wrestler now. I don't, I don't know. You know, you know his story more than I do, but yeah, I know that he got into indie wrestling just for fun and yeah. uh, did some, some insane death matches. Um, uh -huh. but great character, bleach blonde surfer, bro. Uh, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I mean that's 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 about summarizes the role, <laughs> you know. Um, he didn't have too many lines. I mean, he, he. I think what's funny is that, like the the characters sort of win over the people that they hot that they took hostage, and they like let let him out sort of as like you got to let somebody free. They let him out, and then he came back. He wanted <laughs> to get back in, you know. So that just shows you how exciting his life was. You know, he was like, I want to get. I want to go back. So, but yeah, I don't uh, know if this was like, I, I don't know if it was his first movie, but certainly his first time really recognizing him on screen like that. And he went from this to scream shortly afterwards. So again, here's that trajectory airheads, man. Well, uh, and if you think about it, his sister was much more famous at this po point, Patricia, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Patricia Arquette. And, um, and then, you know, going into scream, then he marries Courtney Cox. Right. right. So, like talk about the ascension over a limited amount of time. Like, are the are, are the Arquettes the first siblings that we've talked about across all the plot all the podcast shows so far? Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe, yeah. maybe they win that distinction. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, another thing about the scene where they first introduce Carter here, David Arquette's character, is something that's a recurring theme throughout, which is something as when you're younger, you don't necessarily notice. As an adult, you do notice. Uh, his office was kick ass. Like he had mm -hmm. all these stickers and posters. You've got Megadeth, Cam FDM, mm -hmm. Anthrax, Skid Row. You've got a Rip magazine cover with Anthrax mm -hmm. on it. Like this is all music I listen to now. Right. <laughs> and have has has played a major role in my life. So little things like that the stickers in the, their van like these are all legit bands they, there was well, no like there's no like nickelback sticker where you're like that band wasn't a real right. band and all, all those little details make this authentic you know yes. um as as fanboys like you and i are when we could look back at this um yeah it, it's cheese you know it's not necessarily a realistic movie but there is authenticity to it in terms in terms of like how the music industry was certainly some of the behaviors that were happening um but the detail is all there all the bands that are that are mentioned um you know all the detail in the background what cds are floating around the 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 radio station what posters are on the wall the artists that they're talking about so this is clearly a movie written by music fans for music fans you know well, and as as like as like rock guys, uh, metalheads, anytime you can feel like you're represented, um, which is funny because you know representation matters in way more in way more important roles than in metalheads. Yeah, <laughs> but it just goes on a microcosm to show as like as us as two white male metalheads that seen a rock movie with a Megadeth sticker like you're like that's my band that's my thing this is my mm -hmm. movie like and uh that I think 
again, as a kid that resonated with me to be like, yeah, like I want to do this. Like at the time I'm going to school and I don't, it's not really a thing, you know, it's not until high school or college that you start meeting like-minded people and you, you find that scene, you know, at 12 years old, I'm not going to concerts. So, um, but I know that's what I want to be doing (laughs) as soon as I can. Yeah. Metal hadn't really like shed. It's like distinction of being like only for evil Satan worshipers. (laughs) Yeah. You know? So, you know, and for a long time it was like that. So when you get to see that on screen, you get validated. You're like, dude, see, I'm not just some misunderstood guy. Like I do have legitimate, you know, uh, awareness and I do recognize talent and my music and my genre should be represented. So it makes you feel good to be sort of like validated in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Uh, Dude, Michael Richards, Michael Kramer's in this movie also. (laughs) He's um he play he he is, he might have like the best scene in the whole movie too. He plays Chris Moore, who's like the record record executive to come there. He's actually an undercover cop. But part of their demands, like the ransom demands, were like, you know, we want a record contract. So he shows up and they're, you know, <laughs> playing the party, knocks on the door, and they come over. And he's like, yeah, I'm here to offer you a record. So they quiz him. And like, that's probably one of the best parts of the scene, whether it's, of the movie rather. And he's like, uh, well, I got to, and Chaz is like, I got to ask you a question. Whose side did you take, David Lee Roth or Van Halen's? And he's like, he's like, what? He's like, whose side, Halen or Roth? And they're like, he's like, Van Halen. They're like, wrong. He's a cop. You know, and it's like, that's like the best part, one of the best parts of the movie. I love that scene. So, so I got to point something out. You're confusing two actors. What I do? Oh <laughs> shit! Oh my god! I did. I totally. It. So wait, I'll, I'll back up and we'll, we'll pretend that didn't happen. I'll go back to Michael Richards. Right. So Michael Richards, Doug Beach. He's the radio station's accountant. Classic right. Michael Richards. He's uh, he's Kramer from Seinfeld. Physical comedy. He's acting as a policeman side man on the inside he's climbing through the air ducts like die hard he he really essentially his his importance in the film is so that there's another angle to look at so you're not just going from one scene to the next back and forth back and forth here's this third element which is there's a man on the inside and he's being totally kramer he's being very animated he's being all, all all over the place it's it's great and this is like I don't know, you know, probably like the middle of the run of Seinfeld, maybe 94, would you say? Certainly was in the peak of its popularity there, I think. Yeah. Right. I totally messed them up. Ramis was Chris Moore, the the undercover cop as a record executive. Sorry, man. I got excited, you know. Um, But like I said, great part of that movie where he's just like being questioned by the guys. And he's like, yeah, you're wrong. You're a cop. That whole that whole scene arguably is like the most quotable part of that movie as well. A um, couple of the other lines that happened then too. But yeah, Ramis, the whole- Mike, like Michael McKean, probably the most storied person on that in that movie at that time. You know, not only was he an actor, he's a writer, director, producer. I mean, Stripes, Ghostbusters, on and on and on. Um, he was he was he was probably the biggest name really, but just small part role in that in that one. Well, and I would say, you know, like the whole whose side did you take, Halen or Roth, Van Halen, and eh, he's a cop, you know, mm. and the DJ is the one that's saying he's a cop, which just shows what side Ian's on at this point. Mm. He's on the side of rock and roll. Um, that's a very contentious point in rock in the rock community at this point. Totally. Um, and, you know, Nate and I did a Van Halen podcast. Right. And, you know, yeah, Diamond Dave is the man, and the early Van Halen albums are are awesome. But there's also something to be said about what did Dave do once he left, right. and what did they do with a second life with? <laughs> That's what he said. Like, they sold a lot of records. Van Halen yeah, sold a lot they of sold records. so many records. They really did kill it, and um, and he added that dimension. He could play guitar and all this. So I mean, I'm I'm always I'm always David Lee Roth Van Halen over Sammy Hagar Van Halen, mm-hmm, but. When Dave leaves the band, personally, I gotta go Sammy when he mm-hmm. when Dave leaves the band. He he had some 
Dave had some great hits. Like he, he was kind of in like Wonderland at that point, being David Lee Roth, the the celebrity, more than David Lee Roth, yeah. the musician. Yeah, I, I'm not a big enough Van Halen fan to to really want to get too in depth in that. But I'm gonna go with the with the Lone Rangers on this one and say it's David Lee Roth. I would take you more for like the Gary Sharon era Van Halen. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, the, the whole Van Halen scene is definitely some great writing for this film. There's yeah. a lot of other favorite moments in mm -hmm. this film. Mm -hmm. uh, what other whatever thing other things stand out to you um, in watching this movie? Uh, you know, we talked about it before. We're like Adam Sandler sort of establishes himself like as like this is the model of character that he's going to be playing. And in one scene in particular, like where. There's that like quintessential Adam Sandler freak out, you know, and in this scene, Pip's like teaching him how to be like scary with the gun. You know what I mean? To, you know, he's good. Like you got to threaten people with it. So he's like, you know, I want you to be serious, be threatening. So he's like, you know, get aggressive. And he's trying to teach him. So he's like, so Pip's like, I'm going to stab your heads off. And he's like, with what? With what? With my dick. <laughs> <laughs> and blood's gonna come out of your head. There's nothing you can do about it because I'm a madman. You know, and it's totally quintessential. And Rex is like, that's good. He's like, oh, that kind of hurt my throat. You know, so it's like the it's the highs and lows that Sandler delivers really well that becomes like the cornerstone of every movie that he does after that. Well, and that and it should be noted that Michael Richards' character is in the air ducts above them, so yeah. he has no idea that they're not talking right. to anybody. Right. And and I think the writing is so good because it um it's layer it's funny upon funny upon funny until he delivers that final line. But even Buscemi's line before that was funny. It was like, "Hey, you, you shut your mouth, you bastard! Or I'll stab your eyeballs out and piss all over your brain. It's gonna be a slaughterhouse with bodies flying through the air like dolls on fire." <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then Sandler's response is like, uh, uh, "Excuse me." Uh, right. uh, <laughs> and then he, and then he snaps, and he goes into that traditional, quintessential Adam Sandler losing it role. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, uh, that's what that's what's funny to me. They could have just went right to the Adam Sandler, but instead they like amped it so it's funny. It's funnier, a little bit funnier, and then you just die. Everybody's and, and laughing. Both guys deliver their lines like only they can because that's like totally mr pink you know what i mean where he's like this sort of like creepy silent like low-key killer you know um when she picks up that role other times like in fargo and the sopranos and you know what i mean like he he kind of plays that guy and then sad and bring sandler brings that like sort of that over the top, slightly moronic thing. Um, yep. So it's it's a really good scene that like you know both guys really you know capitalize on in 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 you know earlier and and later parts of their career. Uh, we got a we got a listener comment here. Uh, Sweet Van Halen cover in this movie. I'm the one. Um, I I thought it was. I think it's a good cover. I think it's cool. I mean, maybe it would be cooler if it was actually Van Halen, but yeah. I think the uniqueness or like the way to make it its own like thing in the nineties, uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah. So, uh, w one of my favorite scenes is, uh, you know, I already mentioned about seeing that white zombie performance at the club at the whiskey, which is a legendary club. Um, <laughs> it, it, classic Chris Farley scene. He comes into the club, <laughs> The rock guys are kind of pushing him and he's kind of trying to be all cool and walking through. He ends up getting caught in the mosh, you know, thrown into the mosh pit. He's getting bounced around. Uh, he's, he's finally leaving. He he's found Chaz's girlfriend and uh, you know, some big burly shirtless metalhead dude with nipple rings and a nose ring. He's like, check out Barney Fife. He rips off his badge bites it with his teeth you know it's like his intimidation methods and you've got the dopey chris farley cop character um you know and they're kind of like what are you gonna do about it and the same way that that guy ripped off the badge chris farley rips out the guy's nipple ring which is yeah. like a very resonating image right <laughs> that you kind of always uh will remember and he you know just rips it off and simply answers improvise in his, <laughs> in his chris farley tone 
you can definitely feel that. Like I could feel when you see that scene, you can feel that happening to you. Um, you know, this movie it definitely is that is that time capsule of the nineties. So I particularly like the cameo, the Colin cameo from Beavis and Butthead uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, like you uh, said, this movie introduced you to White Zombie. I think Beavis and Butthead actually introduced me to White Zombie. Very or, cool. Or like I think because, you know, they would do like their metal. They would yeah. do like their metal reviews. And they'd be like, that's kick ass. Cool. You know, and they'd so. Either I saw it for the first time on Beavis and Bedhead, or I saw it on MTV, and then very quickly afterwards, they were talking about how cool it was. But I was a huge, huge fan of that show from for so many reasons, dude. First of all, like I am butthead in so many ways. You know? <laughs> like it just I didn't want to say anything. Me and my friends, you know. <laughs> uh, but just two cartoons that like listen to metal and make fun of people all day long. Like that's us, man. You know. I mean, yeah. So when they call in, I had forgotten this scene. And what I also, what I appreciate too, is like, you know, doing my own sort of amateur voiceover stuff and and doing podcast work and just appreciating the talent of that. Mike Judge as just a voiceover guy, you know, listening to Beavis and Butthead, like they might be the two most distinct characters that you hear auditory and you're like, man, there's no doubting who they are, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And when you hear them, it's kind of like seeing Farley on screen. You can't help but smile as soon as you hear their laughs. Like the, the, you could, it could just be a loop of them laughing and I will laugh, you know? So uh, they didn't even have to have like that. You can't have a cameo of their cartoons, but just hearing their voices. I love that. I love that. That evoked that reaction in me. I had forgotten all about it. It kind of just brought those memories back for me. Um, well, especially in 1994 if you're seeing this for the first time yeah you know random callers calling into the radio station and then you're like like you said you instantly recognize the voices yeah and what a, what a slice of 1994 um you've got kramer in this movie right. and then you've got beavis and butthead in this movie as like though th there couldn't be bigger stars at this moment in time <laughs> and uh it was it was the um the 90s MTV was different than the 80s MTV, right? And like 90s MTV, a big part of that was Beavis and Butthead. Oh, yeah. Um, and you talk about like the way they would like ridicule music videos and stuff like that. Um, they wouldn't just rip apart bad bands. They would rip apart awesome bands. Right. And sometimes they would get into it. And uh, I would say the first time I saw Primus was Beavis and Butthead. The first time I saw Ween was mm -hmm. Beavis and Butthead. Mm -hmm. And the first time yeah. I saw Guar was Beavis and Butthead. And like all yes. three of those are like easy <laughs> to make fun of. So like as a kid, I was like, man, these bands are freaking weird. <laughs> like Ween is weird. And then, you know, fast forward and I'm seeing them later, you know, like because many years later, I've become a total music prog weirdo that's into all that stuff. <laughs> and they, I think Beavis is, or, or Butthead's like, solely re responsible for millions of americans just uh, like just you're allowed to say you guys suck you know like <laughs> <laughs> you're allowed to say that now to people because it's like a part of the common vernacular on tv well just, and whether you're you're sitting around with your friends like just watching things and making fun of it and talking about it or you're by yourself and you're watching your friends beavis and butthead do it like that's eternal dude so that was that's definitely one of my favorite parts it was just like oh man just took me right back um one of my favorite parts was the ridiculous ransom list that the lone rangers start putting together they start putting it together so that they get the great idea hey we can plead insanity later if we ask for the most bizarre list of things um, some of which includes airplay, a helmet filled with cottage cheese, a Zon walnut bass, a PRS guitar with the dragon inlay. Um, and, you know, normal things like naked pictures of B. Arthur from the Golden Girls. <laughs> <laughs> Not to undermine the importance of the Golden Girls in that era, too, dude. They were like the queens of comedy. Golden yeah. Girls is like one of the greatest sitcoms ever. It's one of those things on paper. You'd be like, yeah, right. Like that <clears> would <throat> take the nation by storm and like generationally still be awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, 
Golden Girls is just as good as like the Fresh Prince. Like that's a <laughs> that's a major. Dude, I cannot part believe you just compared Fresh Prince to the Golden Girls team. I'm just thinking like what is so polar opposite but held in equal regard. Like <laughs> wow, well. they, two two series that like took America by storm and people love it and. <laughs> <clears throat> that uh, when when another scene too and it's and it's similar we talked about before when uh Harold Ramis comes up Chris Chris Morris's character and they do, they do the Van Halen scene um uh, the Chaz is like one more question who would win in a wrestling match Lemmy or God and the cop and, and Chris is like Lemmy and they're like and he's like God and they're like wrong dickhead trick question Lemmy is God first of all they're so right. Second of all, <laughs> you know, just kudos for like bringing that up in '94. I feel like Motorhead is one of these bands that got sort of the recognition that they deserved after Lemmy died. You know, so to be able to say that in Lem in '94 and have cameos of Lemmy later on, and you know, again, it's an, it's it's clearly written by fans for fans, yeah, metal absolutely. fans. And that is a great scene for all those reasons, dudes. Yeah, I'd be curious to see who they like brought in to like pop up the script or like review it and mm -hmm. say like, "Hey, yeah, uh, we don't want Winger in there. We want right. Motorhead." Like, right. who who came in to make those make those calls? Because whoever it was did did a killer job. Um, There's probably only two two artists uh, that you can even put in that conversation when you talk about metal gods it's lemmy or it's ozzy right because who else sort of has that recognition like that has well there's that the guy that's the guy that's named the metal god which is halford halford yeah <clears throat> uh, i mean i suppose on a, on a worldwide level is he recognized i guess so yeah so maybe there's yeah. three people then all right well, you know, we'll cover that on our Judas Priest podcast, which we'll be doing in <laughs> we'll be doing in eight days. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I better start studying. <laughs> uh just for our listeners, we are not doing a Judas Priest podcast in the next eight days. But mm -hmm. uh we may need to give Ken eight years and then he'll be prepared to uh come to the table and we can do the full uh full gamut like we did for Maiden. But yeah, I, I that that one's just daunting to me. Uh but uh Open for discussion. I'll ask you the first question from the podcast. What's your favorite song off the fight album? <laughs> Can't do it. Can't do it. I, I, you know, Alfred ah, Solo, I don't know, man. Question. Into the pit. Come on. We all know that. Alfred Solo. Can't do it. Can't talk about it. That's what I'm saying. I don't have the research. Oh. All right. So moving on. Um, the boys in the Lone Rangers, you know, they break in. They got their demo tape. For whatever reason, they bring in the demo tape on reel to reel, um, yeah. which even in '94 was like ridiculous. And they're like, "We can't play this. We can only play. We're modern. We only can play cassette tapes or CDs. <laughs> so um, they can't play it. It, I, it. it lights on fire, actually. So the only copy is a backup cassette tape, which mm -hmm. was given to <clears throat> his girlfriend, uh, which she throws out the window when she breaks up with him. And so there's a, a, a number of scenes showing it like being smashed by a low rider cars, getting peed mm -hmm. on it by a dog, like all sorts of stuff happening, which are just, it just adds to the comedy elements to the movie. They're, it's pretty silly, but also it just puts across the point. Like this tape is doomed. Well, it's also sort of talking about too, that how the, the technology of the industry is evolving as well. Right. Maybe there's Absolutely. a little bit of that conversation that's happening too, but then actually I think the next scene Chaz's girlfriend comes in. She, Kayla is the only one who has that tape. She goes and retrieves it, brings it in. And she's like, I came all the way down here just to bring that stupid tape. And Rex <laughs> was like, yeah, and you took, real, you took real good care of it, didn't you, Yoko? You know, I love that. It's a simple throwaway line, you know, and the joke is the punchline is Yoko. But, you know, as everybody knows that was Lenin's girlfriend that the world hated, you know. So it's just another example of those guys thrown in lots of little music history and yes. nods to the industry. Um, you know, I'm going to keep circling back on this theme, like by fans for fans, you know what I mean? And there's like, actually quite a lot of that in the movie. Um, this one's not subtle. It's, it's like, you know, name dropping Yoko. So that's, you, when you hear it, you know, but there's a lot of little subtle 
you know, um, uh, music history anecdotes in this movie. If, that you can, if you really went through it with a fine pick comb, you'd find them. You'd find a lot of them. Well, and it's like the whole, it's the whole, like, if you know, you know, like mm -hmm. they're, they're universal right, right. truths. The stuff about Lemmy, that's like a universal truth that you hold this guy in high regard. Like even to this day, everyone mm -hmm. knows that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, blaming Yoko Ono for breaking up the Beatles is like a universal truth. Like people just, people just, whether it's, whether it's right or wrong, like that's just something that people have always said and considered as a reason why they separated and went their own ways. Um, another moment towards the end of the movie that I love is, um, so after the, uh, the, uh, what was his name? Uh, Carl Mace. He's the off kilter SWAT guy. Yeah. After he finds out that it was a pool boy that is part of the Lone Rangers, he's got to get a real gun into Michael Richards' character. So they get a real gun in there. He's climbing through the ducks. Um, it's only a matter of time before the fake water <clears throat> pistol Uzis break and the hot sauce goes all over the floor and they're exposed. So it looks like everything's over. They're going to go to jail. This is not going to work out. Michael Richards character sticks the real gun out the duct. Ian hits it with a giant baby bottle because of course there's a giant baby bottle. Right. <laughs> and was that ever uh, explained why that was there. That was on the, uh, the ransom list. Oh, okay. So that was one of the weird, yeah, ransom items. I don't know if they actually verbally said it, but it came in with the collection of oh, ridiculous okay. items that they were providing to them. Um, but what what's bizarre about this is it's like they got fake guns, they got fake guns. Real gun gets knocked out of the hand of Michael Richards, hits the ground, shoots real bullets, live ammo out the front of the building into right. the crowd of people that are partying. And now everybody's like, they got real guns, they got real guns. Uh, Ian grabs the gun, he holds it on Chaz, and then very quickly turns it around and gives it to Chaz because he's happy to be taken hostage by these rock stars because he believes in rock and roll. Ian's a cool dude. Like, what, What's that syndrome? Like you fall in love with your kidnappers after a while? Uh, Stockholm, Stockholm syndrome. syndrome. Is that what that is? Yeah. It's kind of like that's what happened here, you know? And same thing like earlier, David Arquette's character, like he wants to come back inside because he realized that's like where the cool scene is. You know, yep. Ian's like, dude, you take the gun. I believe in what you're doing. You guys are cool. I want you to succeed, you know? Yes. So um, <clears throat> that's kind of what that image or, or that that scene uh, represents, I think. Yeah, Ian's legit. He's um he's throughout the movie, he's very cynical about the music industry, the mm -hmm. corporate aspects of it. He's a true believer in rock and roll. So to see that these three guys, you know, like he gives them the mic and he's like, You got the mic. What did you want to say? Like, we just want to be heard, man. And right. it's like, yeah, here's your chance. Here's, yeah, here's a microphone, a right? What are you gonna say? He looks at him like, what do you He's like, there's 10,000 screaming fans. What do you say? And Chaz says, rock and roll, you know, like, and that's, it's kind of the reality of a lot of it is like, it is the rebellion of rock and roll. Like, it's not mm -hmm. necessarily that you're trying to change the world. Um, but by being pure rock and roll, you can change the world. Like it's, it's a culture in itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Speaking of that, like pure rock and roll, there's a scene at the end where, um, you know, Chaz comes outside. He's like having this moment of sincerity to, um, his girlfriend. And, you know, he was, he sort of admits that he, or he, he admits that he was a geek in high school. It's like, I had really long, I had really short hair. I played dungeons and dragons. I had a bug collection. I ate my boogers. <laughs> my name's not Chaz, it's Chester. So I understand if you don't love me anymore. And then one dude pops up. He's like, I play D&D too. And then all of a sudden, Lem Lemmy's standing there. And he's like, I was the editor of the school newspaper. And another guy's like, I used to wear corduroy pants. I used to, mat and another dude pops up. I used to <laughs> masturbate constantly. Well, the, I mean, the fact is, well, there's a lot that's going on in that scene that I that I love. Yes. The fact is you get, you get now you get the, cam the Lemmy cameo. So they've already mentioned him as a god. Now you're seeing him on screen. And that's a, that's great. Um, stuttering John is the dude who says I used to masturbate constantly, who was like, you know, sidekick on the, was on this soundtrack somehow. Um, 
But <clears throat> I think what's hilarious about this scene more than anything else is the the fact that like he admits that he was a geek in high school and he's like, I used to play D and D. So I used to play D and D. And guess what? If you and there's crossover. If you play D and D, chances are you're a metalhead, right? But yep. let's be honest, dude. You are a geek if you played fucking Dungeons and Dragons. It's there's no doubt about it. And I had like a group of friends. Hopefully they're listening. Kessler, if you're out there, they 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 tried to like they played again later as adults, and they were trying to loop me in, you know, rope me into that shit. They're like, dude, you should sit down and we could just like hang out and play D and D. And I was like, dude, there's no way that I'm fucking doing that. <laughs> but this scene reminds me of all that shit, man. It's hilarious. Well, well I would say like. In response to that, D and D's never been bigger. Like, I think, <laughs> well, I think it is right now. Yeah, Stranger really? Things. Stranger Things. I think really like opened it yeah. up because they yeah. play it on the in the in the show. Um, so they just started really like, ki- it was cool for kids to play. The 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 parents now are seeing their kids and instead of it being like it's this satanic thing mm-hmm. where you're going to commit suicide mm-hmm. they're like no play the game like it's creativity this is right. this is creativity this is healthy social interaction with your friends that's not a computer it's not a screen it's like it's using your imagination um and then there's like this big revival with adults playing it because adults get together and they play these games um Joe Manganiello, you know who he is? I was just going to say, Sofia Vergara's husband, like, I saw Dude. a thing on him. He, like, yeah. gets a group of, like, celebrities together to play this shit. He's I don't got, know like, a literal, him. like, dungeon in his house that has, like, this big, <laughs> fancy table. He has a great company, though. I would I would recommend you check it out. It's called Death Saves. Like, Death Saves, like, in Dungeons & Dragons. And it's all Dungeons & Dragons themed, uh, like, super metal t-shirts, like orc pendants uh you can get like all this really cool stuff like really if you're, if you're a metalhead if you're into fantasy stuff boris vallejo frank Fen- franzetta style stuff definitely check out death saves um but i think he's helping though um he's helping make it cool right um right the problem is there's like gatekeepers that are like actual like really nerdy antisocial people that are out there that are like this dude can't be into dungeons and dragons because he's like handsome and he's uh he's he's an actor and he's a celebrity and all this like no this is ours which i understand um but the reality is like he's also knocking down a lot of walls for a lot of people to enjoy 1994 dungeons and dragons was really dorky like that was like Oh my God, Chester, your name was Chester and you were a nerd and you had short hair and like <clears throat> all this stuff. It was like the epitome of not cool. Um, the world has changed a lot since 1994. Yeah. Like, well, a it, lot of- you know, going back to the validation thing, like this movie validates our interests and our likes and our beliefs as a kid. D&D, you roll that in there. d and is just the one thing for me that I never really got back on in nostalgia train for. Sure. Sure. Um, you know, I like to bag on it, but it was definitely cool. I mean, and it crossed over. I remember going to the comic book store and they would have like just the D and D section, like the figurines. So you could, you could, uh, you know, buy the little like die cast metal guys and you'd get like the little tester paints and you'd sit there with your brushes sure. in the basement and I'd paint all those models up or in this one place I used to go to, they had like some guy was painting them and he would sell them pre-painted for like five bucks each or whatever, which seemed like a lot of money at the time. And he was a great painter. And I remember being like, oh, look, going and just looking at the case. And d d was a big, it was cool. It was cool back then. Sure. But now, like as, as a man, I don't want to be like, you're walking down the forest. All of a sudden behind the tree and I, the beholder jumps out. What are you going to do? Oh, quick. Let me roll my 20 sided die. And you know what I mean? I'm like, okay, you know, I got, I got other things. Hater, hater. <laughs> I got other things I'm going to do besides that. But well, I I can attest to that pre-pandemic, my design <laughs> team, uh, we were we were playing D and D every Wednesday. So I believe it. Every Wednesday we play D and D. Um, I've got a very talented designer who he actually 
creates like fantasy art and gaming stuff uh -huh. um, but he's like an awesome dungeon master um and he it's funny because he's he's a pretty quiet guy pretty shy pretty quiet uh but as soon as he's dungeon mass he's dungeon mastering if that's right. the right term to use uh he is like awesome like just he takes control of the room he's very organized he's got all the the maps and the characters and all the stuff he had he had dice for all the people who didn't have their own dice um and you know what's really cool um i have a i have a very diverse office of designers that work work for me and uh, -huh. uh not a single person declined the invite to play yeah. so you got this whole team of various ages of different you know different people different backgrounds and we're all playing this strategy game together, you know, this this role playing game together and just a cool um, modern team building exercise, right. I guess, if you will. I, I, if you I, that's cool. I mean, look, and you can play snacks and eat and drink. <laughs> I mean, it's it's fun. It's a good social thing. Well, but for, for, for people like you and I, too, like I, I can understand, like not really having time for it outside yeah. of like. Yeah you know, we're so busy. We have like a million projects going on. So the fact that we can play it like over, over lunch is, uh, is a pretty cool way to be able to like get that in without needing to like take up a Wednesday night or something. You can get a game in that quick. Isn't it like, uh, well, you know, ongoing, ongoing campaign. Know, so, know, you know, we play for, you know, two hours or whatever and, uh, play once well, I mean, a week. I still remember all this shit. My, my buddy actually sent me this text like like two weeks ago um mccready if you're out there there's a shout out I, he gets sends me this text he's he's on the east coast he sends me a text i'm out in california and, and it's like it's like 10 or 11 my time at night so i know that he's up late drinking still and he goes real quick what's the name of the five-headed dragon from dungeons and dragons you have two minutes to answer you can't look it up and um I, I knew the answer. I actually didn't get the text until later because I was busy doing stuff. But I saw it and immediately, I go, oh, it's Tiamat. I knew immediately. I knew immediately. So you retain all that stuff because, you know what, at the time it was cool. You know, I like bagging on it, but I, I saw the value of it then. And I'm glad all the things that we were into as kids is cool now. Hey, so maybe, like maybe, this. maybe someday you'll be playing with your son and you won't be as lame. <laughs> maybe. I mean, but it is proof. Like, look, look on TV, dude. Everything is Marvel, DC. The the nerds rule the rule Hollywood and the and the nerds rule the universe. I mean, they're Tesla and Google and Apple and everything else. So the, the nerds win across everything. They are yeah, the I think you're seeing. I think you're seeing a shift, and obviously there's a big an, there's big anti bullying campaigns and stuff like that. But yeah. like, it's I I don't know. I mean, I don't hang out at high schools, so I don't know. But hmm. uh, I don't know that the like quarterback of the football team is the coolest guy in school anymore. Like right. maybe it's the guy that's the head of the the RPG club. <laughs> like who who knows? Like. Right. What, uh, it seems like the world is a, is a different, evolving, progressing place where um, it's more than like just one thing is cool. Like right. you can be into Dungeons and Dragons and you can play on the football team and there's nothing wrong with that. And it doesn't to me, have to be your dark secret. Was like the dude who drove like the jacked, you know, K5 Chevy Blazer, Blazer on like 35 inch tires with like four inch lift. I'm like, I got <laughs> cool, man. And he was blasting Sabbath, you know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so my final favorite moment of the movie is at the end when they finally get their live performance, their amp, mm -hmm. they get up on stage. Chaz has got this like kick ass PRS guitar. They're ready to rock. And all of a sudden they're just playing their song over the PA and they're like, just pantomime along. We're going to film a music video and blah, blah, blah. And the Lone Rangers refuse to pantomime along. They're like, you know, they're real rock and roll. They're not going to do it. They clearly show the crowd that they are not going to lip sync. And uh, I think there's something to be said for that. And that's a big message throughout the film is like, we're, we want to do this the pure real way. Right. That's authentic to the theme of the movie of the movie, which is, you know, let's capture some of these really specific details about the industry. Um, you know, the live performance. I mean, that was big. Think about back in the scandals and back then the whole Millie Vanilli debacle where it came out that, you know, they didn't even sing. They didn't even write them. They didn't even perform them. And they got like 
you know, Grammys off of that. So um, I know that like in today's thing, the biggest, the biggest event that you can perform is the Super Bowl. And like sure. most, I don't even think the performers get paid for it because the publicity enough is like their quote unquote payment. Yeah. Usually they don't let them, they'll pre-record it. They'll sing live and pre-record it and then play that, but they won't give them live audio because of the setup is too difficult to set that up within minutes, which is what you sure, have here. Yeah. Set up a breakdown within minutes. is usually, It's like logistically not possible, but supposedly the weekend did it this past one live. Bruno Mars did it live. Mm -hmm. I know that I, I read something when I was looking this up, like Lady Gaga called Shakira and JLo and they were like, dude, you chicks better play live. Don't do this bullshit, you know, lip sync stuff. Yeah. Um, so it is important to a lot of people, you know, um, and that's the essence of rock and roll, dude. Go out, be yourself, let your talent showcase. So something that we always love to cover with movies and, and, you know, as we're digging into these movies is some of the like fun facts about the movies, the things that don't just jump out and you might not know behind the scenes about the mm -hmm. movies. Um, you know, I think in the filming of this, one of the things that I found most fascinating was that this, this movie was filmed at Fox Plaza 2121 Avenue of the stars, which is century city, Los Angeles, California. Um, the significance there is that the building, uh, the radio station building, it shares a parking lot with the same building uh, that was used as Nakatomi Plaza in mm -hmm. Die Hard, which is another legendary film. We've talked about the call outs, the nods to the music industry. Chaz comes out at the end and he's like addressing the crowd, firing them up. And he says, uh, they've got the guns, but we've got the numbers. That's actually lyrics from uh, Five to One by The Doors. So, uh, you know, everybody knows that song. It's five to one, baby. One in five. No one here gets out alive. That's just one of those other little things. If you know, you know. If you don't, well, then you missed it. But I, love, I love that song by Danzig. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, so you think I sound like Danzig? I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, you Doors fan? I am a Doors fan. Yeah, I'm not yeah, an Uber fan, true. but um, I, dude, Morrison's voice is awesome. You know, oh, I yeah. mean, you can't deny that. So, um, and their music, you know, they're OG rock guys, and uh, they were able to transcend a lot of sounds, a lot of people. So, you know, big, big time. You, you got to put them, give them recognition that they deserve. And this movie gives a little nod to them. Yeah, true, true, uh, true artists, true poets. And such a such a small, unfortunate window to create. Like, if you look at the amount of work that they put out, but the right. amount of time that they were actually a band, like Quick. there is not a lot of time that they had, and it's uh, unfortunate what they could have been. Um, and they're, I feel like they're kind of like Van Halen, where they were kind of ahead of a music scene, or maybe mm -hmm. a little behind a music scene. Like they were they were doing something totally new, so maybe they didn't get they get a lot of accolades, but they could have gotten even more accolades for what mm -hmm. they contributed to, mm -hmm. to music. Um, another fun fact here was that Michael McKean uh, in this movie, he's like that character that you see a lot popping up in the nineties, like the record execs, the radio shop, uh, radio show manager. They, they, they are always, uh, always suits and ponytails is the way that I put it. They always had like right. a short little stubby ponytail. Like right. you said, the Bob rock look, you right. know? Um, and uh, the funny part about that is that he, you know, in auditioning for the movie, he had recently cut off a ponytail. So he, for whatever reason, he saved his own ponytail in a bag, brought it to the audition, said, if you give me this role, I will wear this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it really completes the look. And that's crazy. You know, they thought he could be the pretentious backstory stabbing ladder climbing asshole that he was and and he really embodied that role suits and ponytails yeah <laughs> That's um, so what he he sort of ran the station um was, was that his role he was uh he was the the st yeah, he was a station manager yep uh, of kppx 103.3 um that was modeled after kanak um 105.5 which was a real radio station in la and actually 
they both sort of befell same um uh what's the word they 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 had they had similar fallings like Kanak eventually switched over and was i mean that was the rock radio station in la for a very long time you know famous djs if you got on the radio station the chances of you getting airplay was good and your career was going to take off but they very right around the same time that this station was switching to easy listening they switched over to like spanish music so um it kind of had this this weird parallel path uh, but really, you know, it's it's a snapshot of that time frame. We, I mean, we talk about this being a capsule. Well, I mean, you had two avenues. You had MTV and you had and you had radio. Yeah. So, um, you know, these kinds of personalities, these were like real things that existed out there, like the sleazy radio executive, record executive and like the suits and ponytail guy. Like, look, I'm hip, man. I'm in the music industry. I know what you're doing. Yeah. But you know what? They're just like they're just greasing these musicians and, you know, and they're giving them a lot of, you know, false hope and false promises in order to just make a buck really for themselves, which is what they're trying to do. But uh, that was the way of the world back then. Yeah. I think of, um, I remember Milwaukee, which is where I grew up, um, Milwaukee area. Um, they had a radio station called 93 QFM. Mm -hmm. And the thing about 93 QFM is they were the only station in town that would play Metallica. Like, so they were like mm -hmm. the hard rock station. And, uh, so I remember when they went off the air, the other rock station, which was laser one Oh three. And the one that I probably listened to the most in my life, um, they played Metallica in honor of 93 QFM, you know, as a way of saying like respect, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I remember, you know, young Baxter sneaking down from my bunk bed to like plug my headphones into my little boom box. Um, every night at 10 p.m., Laser 103 would have what they called mandatory Metallica. So mandatory Metallica. for those listening that, uh, you know, are younger than Ken and I, they remember they don't remember a time where like radio didn't play Metallica. Like right. that was too heavy. Or so any metal. They, they, they didn't play Metallica. Like nowadays, Metallica is like classic rock. Like, right. Right. You hear it, you hear it everywhere. Um, but so I would, I would tune into the, you know, to hear those three Metallica songs. I remember the DJ's name was Mark Elliott. So his, uh, his, his like handle for that segment was Mark Elliott Talica, um, <laughs> which kind of like later influences me to become Baxter of puppets. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, um, was that a Milwaukee station or a Chicago station? Milwaukee. Yeah. yeah. Milwaukee. So I listened so to the New York radio stations being from north jersey so we had yeah. like 92.3 k-rock um which was like i mean it was like heavy but didn't play it, it never got heavy heavy and then there was like yeah. 2143 which is another one but what i listened to like religiously in high school was the rent was the, the the local college radio they had metal nights on friday nights 90.3 wrpr which is rampo college and back then you could actually call in like Beavis and Butthead. They had like radio, you know, I could never get through to the big New York stations because there's like, you know, hundreds of thousands of listeners or whatever the population is, millions. I don't know. But like radio stations for college stations had small antennas. They weren't even broadcasting that far. I lived eight miles from the school. But so I did have contests and you could call in and actually get through. I got through a couple times. Yeah, yeah. Um, I won a, I won some sort of package. They like pulled all this swag that they had in their office and they sent me like some terrible shirt and they sent me like a Voivod cassette and, you know, weird things like that. But I remember I'd be like, you know, Hey, you want us to play a song? And I'd be like, yeah, um, play, play some Sabbath for me. And they're like, all right, what do you want to hear? And I'd be like, right, I want to listen to, uh, am I going insane off of Sabbath? <laughs> sure. You know, because, then I'm like, it's me telling them, hey, dude, I'm not a poser, dude. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not asking for Iron Man. You know, I'm not yeah, asking yeah. for Paranoid. I'm asking for an obscure thing on, you know, the second side of Sabotage. And then they would play it and I'd hear it. And like, you hear music on the radio. It sounds different. You know what I mean? It sounds yes. good. So I would be really proud of those moments when I'd get those songs. It was It was that and it was like. Stone Cold Crazy, Metallica covering Queen. I always like yeah, requested yeah. those two songs for some reason. Yeah, there's something about like it not just being part of the rotation. 
Yeah. Like nowadays radio feels like it's just a rotation. They just play the same songs. Right. You, it's a pattern. It's repeating. Um, I, I think the 10 year old, 12 year old Ryan Baxter was calling in. I would always request uh, drag the waters by Pantera for some <laughs> reason. Like, and like you Who's said, there's like that, this excitement of like a live person answering your call <clears throat> and you're like, is this the DJ or is this just somebody taking the call? Am mm -hmm. I going to be on the radio? Like, are they going to be like, Oh, we got Ken calling in, um, you know, like, like this guy again. Yeah. It's the, it's, <laughs> it's the, am I going insane guy? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's something really exciting about that. And that's something, you know, that's a, a magical time that has now passed and, right, totally. you know, we can, we can talk about it now, but, uh, there's just something exciting about requesting the song. Um, and like, I, like you with the Sabbath, you know, requesting something to show that you're legit and that you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like for me, it was like, I'm going to request the heaviest thing I can think of because I want them to know that I like heavy music, you mm -hmm. know, because mm -hmm. the station wasn't really that heavy. So, but if you called in like after 10 o'clock or whatever, or, or, you know, later in the night, you might be able to get them to play the new Pantera and, uh, there's something just again magical about that for sure uh so there's a song featured in this movie uh it's uh called degenerated and so when they're making this movie they find this great song and it's uh it's by this band called degenerated and they're like oh we're gonna you know put this this song in the movie we're gonna make it the song that uh the lone rangers are going to perform uh, this is really cool. Uh, well, after putting it in the movie, they realized that it wasn't, it was actually a cover. So Degenerated didn't write the song. They just covered it from a, a legendary, you know, punk, hardcore punk band uh, called Reagan Youth. And so what happens is uh, Reagan Youth, um, because the song was used without cassette, they, they sued the studio, studio and they got, quote, Aerosmith money out of the deal. So mm. it's pretty cool that this like legit punk band who had no expectation of being in a movie, their song happens to get used. They sue, they get all this money and, and uh, probably their biggest payout ever. Yeah, exactly. And then on top of it, uh, the song was actually performed by members of white zombie with uh, Brennan Frazier doing the vocals. It's just mm -hmm. kind of a nice touch to it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we talked about Michael McKean's role in this movie. Michael McKean obviously um, played uh, David Tate Hubbins, the singer of Spinal Tap. So they give out nods to this movie a couple times, which, you know, again, is that, you know, that wink to the industry knowledge. Um, <clears throat> if you look on the walls uh, between the door and the desk, you'll see a, this is Spinal Tap uh, poster on the wall. And then later on when Ian and Milo are wrestling, Ian's got Milo sort of in a headlock. And he's, you know, wrestling on the ground. And Milo goes, uh, he's like, oh, my spine. So very clear, obvious nods to Spinal Tap, which if you've never seen Spinal Tap, it's it's maybe like the best metal movie out there. Um, all in. Uh, one, because of it's when it came out, which um, I think was an early, it was before this in the early 80s. And uh, just it's, it's, you know, it sort of kicks off that whole Christopher Guest mockumentary improv style with all those actors. Um, on so many levels, that movie is just awesome. But rooted in real, in just in reality, too, it really does a good job of, I think, showcasing the reality, but then the silliness of that whole metal scene, that whole music scene. Uh, I, I feel like maybe at some point we need to dive deep into this as Spinal Tab and might get its own podcast. I don't know. Some oh about. yeah, I definitely agree. Like this is yeah. definitely the like the grandfather, godfather, whatever of yeah. metal rock movies. Mm -hmm. Um and I think that the best, most successful, and I think even Airheads does this, it's it's creating something for the people who know what it's like to be in a band, know what it's like to not be able to find the entrance to a stage, know what it's <laughs> like to be like, let's write a song where we only use bass guitar. Right. Um, that I, I'm, I'm sidetracking a little bit, but even like, you know, in, in Spinal Tap, when they get caught in the pod, you can't uh -huh. get out of the pod for the whole song. Like a blow, blow torch to open it up. That's based on a true story. 
Um, <laughs> there is a band called Angel. I don't know if you're familiar with the band Angel, but uh-uh. uh, Angel was, they were kind of like a contemporary to like Kiss maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, they, they kind of just disappeared to history. Like, But they mm-hmm. were a successful band. They had that exact thing happen though. Being caught for an entire song inside this stage pod situation um or like the stonehenge thing i mean again we'll get into this on a spinal tap one but that that was a black sabbath situation where <laughs> well, you got 18 inch stonehenge instead of an 18 foot stonehenge uh actually there's i believe was the opposite they actually made full scale stonehenge and it couldn't fit on the stage <laughs> so sabbath was like yeah just make stonehenge and they made it and they didn't have anywhere to put it so um that's awesome but this is why movies like this are great because they are anecdotal. They come from real stories, real experiences. And if you're not a musician, it kind of gives you a little in like peek behind the curtain right. to see what it's like, because people are not like, if you think Danzig's as evil as he projects on stage or whatever, you know, like he's wearing sweatpants at home, man. Like, <laughs> He, Dan, it, what, what if Danzig was one of us, you know? Like, oh, you mean like he has cats and he buys cat food, you mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Danzig's unfortunately like the metal meme king. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so Airheads, you know, total cult classic. It, it really reached cult status around its 25th anniversary. Um, when in celebration of the anniversary airheads closed out the Cinepocalypse film festival um there was a band uh, a high school in canada that actually put on a stage version of airheads which i would love to see uh-huh. it was probably not as good as like the elementary school that did scarface um and the last thing is a little bit you know a little autobiographical for us which is kuma's corner uh which there are four locations in chicago one in Indiana and one in Denver. I know you were asking about that, Ken. Mm-hmm. Um, but it started in in Chicago. Kuma's Corner, awesome metal burger bar. They have burgers themed after metal bands, everything from black metal to death metal to, you know, everything in between. They even have a Led Zeppelin burger. Uh, they put out a Lone Rangers burger in honor of their 25th anniversary. Dude, I actually have a, uh, I have a, a coaster here, right here from Kuma's Corner. Awesome. I, this was coincidence. I have, I just have that because I, I, I took a stack of them when we went there and I brought them home. Yeah. And I have because I, you know, I keep a drinking here when we're doing this podcast. I just look down. I'm like, oh shit! There's the logo that's up on the screen right now. This is harshing your mellow since 2005. <laughs> West Loop. Definitely. So, uh, um, Tomber, Diversity, Belmont, and West Loop. Those must be the locations in in Chicago. Uh, yeah, dude. This isn't like Hard Rock Cafe. This is like legit heavy metal burger joint dude uh especially the one the the og that you took me to i don't know which one that was but um it's uh phenomenal dude you know any place you can get good food and good tunes sign me up every time i'm in town i'm gonna go there well and the experience is kind of different based on which location you go to sure. like right. the, but the original one is like really like a hole in the wall but mm-hmm. dive bar where they're making the burgers and the smoke from the burgers is like the grease is like wafting through the air over your table and then you've got you know the more of the like hip downtown version uh that we went to with robbie um and then there's the schaumburg version which is near a mall it's like more like feels a little more strip molly right but they all play (laughs) legit metal all the burgers are named after legit bands they have a burger of the month so they had a ghost burger with an actual communion wafer on top like (laughs) just well you you know you made it when it's like the 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 first place which is like feels a little dicey the neighborhood it's certainly divey but you look around and you got like you know quasi suits sitting there you know what i mean you know like when when you draw that crowd that they're no longer scared you're like oh, okay well you've made it and that's why they go and open up the other locations so good for them i mean ultimately that's what you want right as artists you want to be able to get to that Absolutely. point where like you know you open a second location and a third and a fourth and a fifth well, and it's like we we're talking about like representation in film. Like, how about in the dining industry? <laughs> like, we can go, we can be with our people, where you can be served by real metalheads, and mm-hmm. and you know they got like weird movies playing on the TV while you're listening to like Behemoth and just 
I don't know. It's a pretty cool experience. And you know, I, ironically, the first time you and I went there, it was after I was in Chicago with work. With with work, so I was not in my normal like metal <laughs> horror attire that I normally was. I was coming. We were presenting or doing something, you know. So sure, I was yeah. a little bit more professional, and I was pissed as I walked into the place and I saw how legit that I was, that they saw me like in my Clark Kent outfit. You know what I mean? I was like, no, I'm metal. So then I felt like, I felt like I was calling the radio station again and being like, no play. Am I going insane? Don't play paranoid. You know what I mean? Like I had to prove. So I was like, Oh yeah, let me, let me chat up the bartender to let her know how metal I am. You know, that's the kind of place that that's the kind of aura that place had. So then you were like, I can't, I can't order the Iron Maiden burger. I've got to order the Absu to make sure that they know that I'm like <laughs> right. really metal. <laughs> right. <laughs> I want the Amanamarth sauce, please. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I highly recommend that joint. Great food, yeah. great music, great experience. Um, there's obviously they they're growing. There's multiple locations. So shout uh, out to Kuma's Corner. Check it out. Um, so, you know, 1994 is when this movie came out. It is now 2021. It's been 27 years. Um, a lot has changed. I think one of the valuable things about this movie is this is a great time capsule piece of what the world was like in 1994, yeah. Yeah. especially in like music and like uh, the styles of the time. I think, you know, starting with the band itself, the Lone Rangers, like, these guys wardrobe really encompass like what was going on in music at the time. We had, we had the LA scene, the LA sound was kind of dying off. The, the Seattle scene was in full force, but you, you had like kind of a blended crossover at the time. Um, and, and a lot of that is represented by the band. I think that a lot of these movies that you look back on later on, like 20 years later or longer, they all become sort of a time capsule of the time that it was made. You know, that's sure. just the nature of age, right? But this specifically, I think, captured the L.A. perspective of the music industry at that time, as opposed to, like, 90s. They did give nods, and, like, they did give nods to, like, what was happening at the time, because they were like, the guy called up, I forget the comment, but he was like, oh, we don't play that. We don't like that Seattle crap or whatever. He's talking about grunge specifically, but they're, yet they, they're wearing, you know, a lot of that, like the flannel look very much came out of Seattle. They're not, yeah. but it does have like the studded belts that were very much like the LA thing. So there was that crossover. Um, but there was a couple of movies that came out in this time frame that were like that too, that were really good you know, sort of Polaroids of the scene at the time. Um, Singles, which is more of a rom-com, that came out like a couple years earlier, 92. I love that movie. For the same reason you love this movie, you get to see like White Zombie on stage. Um, that's got Alice in Chains on stage and they're like playing live in that club. And that's, you know, um, Soundgarden. And, 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 and it's at the more, it's a real place, a real, yep. real venues. So I, I, when you look back at that, it just sort of I mean, we're still listening to that same music. So when you can kind of go back and it's almost like you're looking at yourself at that time frame, too. It's it's that's what this is all about, this nostalgia. What we're revisiting right now. Um, so these these movies do that. And Airheads did a really good job of doing that. Yeah. And I think they, you know, like, even though he's like, you know, oh, you, you actually listen to that Seattle crap. Like he's poking fun at it, but then he's right. like, all right, well, but you got to come down. I'll give you tickets. You just got to come down right. to the radio station. So like, right. they're kind of like, it's kind of like when you're with your friends and you're like, oh, you like, you like that band? Ken? you mm -hmm. like Chevelle? Like you into that? Like <laughs> That's always <laughs> your example. You dick. You always throw or, it in my face. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, or like, you know, I, you've made comments to me too. Similar. Like it's just, mm -hmm. it's just the nature of like jabbing at your friends, but you're like, you know, I'm not a Chevelle fan, but at the same time, I'm like, they're, they're, they're good. You know, right. they're not a bad band, right. like whatever. It's maybe it's not my cup of tea. It's not right. my thing that I listen to all the time, but like there's, there's, uh, everybody's got those bands in their repertoire that their friends maybe don't listen to, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got, you know, Nate and I were like huge glam fans, you know, huge LA music scene fans. And, 
So, you know, we're always talking rat and skid row and, mm-hmm. and, and, and nitro and pretty boy Floyd and all that crap. And I know that's not really your vibe, but then I come over and we talk about things that are, you know, just off the wall, heavy and whatnot. And I think that's, you know, that's the great part about music is tastes overlap. Uh, well, to set the record straight, I wasn't a huge glam guy, but I was like a fringe glam guy. Sure. You know? Yeah. Because I did like Poison, I did like Molly Crew, but you're kind of getting into that. It's a little heavier, it's a little scarier. Not Poison per se, but like my my initial three were Rat, Quiet Riot, and Twisted Sister. Sure. Not necessarily in that order. It was Twisted Sister one, then Rat, and Quiet Riot. But um, you know, this that whole, I mean, that's the evolution of music, and there's the and and this movie shows that, and it's also the evolution of sort of L.A. at that time. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of societal subtext that's happening in this movie um there's this in in at one point the dj looks over at chaz and he's like he's like hey can i ask you something uh what's with you guys in these tattoos he's like you know yeah 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 He's like, I can, get, I get it. If you had said like mom or, you know, and he's on and on. And then he goes on explaining, he like shows him the Grim Reaper, which is like terrible. And he's like, you know, <laughs> if I finish it, maybe I'm going to, you know, but then tattoos were like for like prisoners and for punks and for, you know, it, there was an aura about it now uh, or about it then. Now it's like every soccer mom's got to tattoos and like, you know, you're way tatted up. I mean, you know, I've just got a sleeve, but it's like, you know, that was it. it yeah, it's I'm just a like nerd that, that plays story. Dungeons and Dragons. So uh-huh. <laughs> what was that? I said, I'm just a nerd that plays Dungeons and Dragons. I know. Do you so. have any D&D tats anywhere? Nah, nah. <laughs> well, there you go. You just, the, just the beholder. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's it's it's another way that the world has changed in this yeah. movie. You know, like just that that quick little conversation about it. Um, now, how many TV shows are about? You know, there's there's Ink Master TV shows, and um, you know, literally every Instagram thing. It's a you know, there's, it's 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 way more it's it's way more accepted. It's good and bad. I think it. You know what I mean? Because one, I think it's important to allow people to express themselves however they want and not be dinged for it or judged for it. But yeah. two, it does kind of take away a little bit of the edge, which let's be honest, that's kind of why I did it. Part of one of the reasons why I did it in the first place, you know? So, you know, when you see anybody who has it, you know, there, there's always this dichotomy to everything. And, you well, know, there's uh, like, there used to be like some unwritten rules about tattoos, right? right. So some of the unwritten rules, like I'm tattooed from my stomach to my back to my arms and all this stuff. So the next evolution would be getting my throat or getting my face tattooed or getting my mm-hmm. hands. Like once you get your hands tattooed, your life's over. Like you are, you are no longer going to be having a job. Like that right. was the way it was looked at. Right. That's and right. Uh, now you've got these kids that are like 18 out the gate. They get their hands tattooed. They get their face tattooed. They get their throat tattooed. And they're naked. The rest of their body is naked. They have no tattoos. And uh, it's just, it's part of, you know, like the whole SoundCloud rapper thing, the mm-hmm. whole internet age. Like there's just this something about like, oh, well, if I get my forehead tattooed, that will that will show you that like I'm I'm down for the cause and I'm legit. And it's like, yo, that's your fast first tattoo is barbed wire across your forehead. Like <laughs> cool man like I, I saw an internet i saw a meme that was like it said uh bad boys back in the day and it showed like a dude and his like whole chest was covered in tattoos and it said bad boys now and it was like a forehead <laughs> tattoo and a neck tattoo and that was it and the rest of them was clear and i was like yeah man that's the world I, mean, I would say it's overall changed. overall it's good um i think it's cool that like dudes like us we can have these corporate jobs right. we can have successful careers in marketing and design right. and uh you know we're not penalized for having stretched ears or tattoos that are visible mm-hmm. um if anything i found in my career uh I, you know, long ago I committed to this is who I am. So right. if you don't want to hire me because I have stretched ears or I have tattoos. I'm not taking these things out. I'm not going to hide these things. 
because I want to work for somebody who believes in me for my talents, for who I am um, and stuff like that. And if anything, I feel like it's benefited in my career as a creative director to right. say, hey, he's the creative guy. He's committed. He's, you know, at 38 years old, he has not gone back on these things. He's he's face value. And that's kind of how I've looked at it. And so I'm thankful that society is like, OK, with that. And I don't have to feel self-conscious that right. I have to change who I am because yeah, before I did this job, I wasn't a band. And before I had this job, I did watch airheads when I was 12 years old. And I said, I am rock and roll and I'm going to commit to this. So I, I don't know. I, I think. Yeah. It's what's funny is, is like the sort of this underlying story in this movie that only extreme rock and rollers were allowed to be themselves back in the nineties. Sure. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And to, and, and then it was like, they had to prove themselves to these like record executives in these fucking suits. You know, I think it is a great thing now that you are, it's more accepted. You can be yourself. You can be tatted up. You can have dyed hair. You can have earplugs. You can do all these things and still like be recognized for your skill set and, you know, the talents that you bring and things like that. So again, this is a, just a different way of this, this movie is sort of showing how things have evolved um, in this case for the positive, you know, uh, I think there's also there there's some unintentional things that happen too. There was there was a scene in this movie where there was like a newscast up on the um there like the you know the, they were watching the 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 newscast on the TV and the radio yeah. show, and the newscaster, a female anchor, was like sort of belittling the fact that these guys had taken over this radio station, and she said, um, <clears throat> "White urban males are the least likely." to elicit tears from a city already beleaguered by a city with real problems. Yeah. Yeah. And that really, I was totally blown. Like out of anything else in this entire movie, that was the one line that I was like, did not really sit with the rest of the movie, which is way more kitschy and silly. And, you know, it did have some underlying, you know, themes to it, but that one really sort of struck me. I'm like, is this, a deliberate statement, a deliberate sarcastic statement, or a statement meant to be humorous and not aging well. Because if the, the the what she said was white urban males are the least likely to elicit tears from a city. Whereas now white urban males are the guys that walk into these places with like AR 15s and are the now urban terrorists. You know what I mean? Yeah. More than any other thing on in our country. I mean, another one today I read in California. I mean, how many we've yeah. had three this week, three shootings this week. You know, I mean, it's like it's it's totally insane. So that statement to me was like, are they being sarcastic or are they is that just a snapshot of like then we were looking at the world differently? And we weren't aware. It started to come around a little bit. And then there's the Rodney King chant later on that's happening outside. And they're like, yeah. Rodney King, Rodney King. And then, you know, um, I think uh, <clears throat> what's dude Marcus is like, why? What's what's that supposed to mean? And then Sandler's like, he's that guy. <laughs> and then it leaves. And that's the end of the scene. No explanation. You yeah. know what I mean? So is that a statement on? you know what? We're not taking this seriously as a country. We're not taking this seriously as a problem. It's a real thing. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think, it, I think it's open for debate, but it shows you how the mentality was in the 90s a little bit. Certainly in the 80s, it was even worse. But I did think that the conversation did start to shift a little bit. We started to talk about racism as a problem. We did start to talk about sexism as a problem, you know, started to address the things. Clearly, to this day, we still haven't figured it out. And it's, it's worse, you know, but maybe then it was starting to come to the to the forefront of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, it goes along with the whole idea of like, well, I live in the suburbs, so I don't see any of that. So it's not my problem. So it doesn't right. exist. If I don't see it, it doesn't exist. Um, I think, to be honest, when I was watching the movie, I don't even I I re I remember that scene, but I, I, I it was so fast with the newscaster, and they just kind of glazed over it. And I, and part of me thinks like, was that their way of justifying that they were just letting these guys like hang out with these guns with these hostages? Right. Right. Like everybody was partying out front, treating right. it like a joke. And um, 
but you're right. Like there's some truth in that, which is the way that's like, oh, well, yeah. Oh, it's white guys. <laughs> We're fine. It's fine. We don't need to worry about them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if it's a bunch of black dudes, they would be like, oh my God, everyone's going to die. Right. This is terrible. Like it's the same way that people are treated when they're pulled over in their cars, you mm -hmm. know, like, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, here's the thing the world the world is a better place than it was in 1994 but uh we are much more aware now of how bad the world can be and is on a regular basis now yeah um we're this is all pre inter pre-information age right. pre-internet like we're just starting to phase into the internet so now people are much more knowledgeable and aware of all the shootings and the situations and the discrimination. And, um, so it's, it's not like, like, I think people have an attitude a lot like, Oh, why is the world such a bad place now? It's like, no, like these things aren't new right. Right. <laughs> and people that don't look like us have been experienced them for a lot, their whole entire lives. Yeah, and this isn't it's a weed just that, that just now, popped up overnight. This, this has been here for a long time. Planting seed. Now, now people are getting some exposure. So yeah. it's going to take a while for people to, you know, acknowledge and understand. And, mm -hmm. 90s was a weird time like we've talked about like they start to bring in these um you know societal issues but they don't know how to like deliver it without like i think there's still a fear of like turning people off or um you know it just hasn't uh, things evolve so no. it's cool it's cool to see that they even like the sexism thing about like uh, you know, when they're talking about sitting and he's like, well, she gets to sit, I get to sit and stuff like that. And it's like, it's nice to see them bringing that in as a point. Like, mm -hmm. even if it is just a joke in a long series of events, um, another, another part in the movie right off the bat, when Chaz is coming in and he's trying to sneak into the, the record, uh, the, um, the record company, um, there's a group of of young guys auditioning. They're all wearing these cat in the hat hats and uh, their manager's there. And he's like, okay, be wild, be as wild as you want to be. You know, if you feel like wetting yourself, go for it. Anarchy's good. And the one kid is like, um, you know, what are we supposed to say? He's like, what? Don't say anything, you know? And it's, this is something that really hasn't changed in mm -hmm. the music industry, which is like, trying to fit in a specific mold just so you can get that level of fame. If anything, it's gotten worse with, with social media, which is like, I'm going to be this influencer. I'm going to be this celebrity. I want to do makeup. I want to do this. It's like, it's all about how do you capture the capture the world by storm. Yeah. And it's not through talent. Right. It's really just through like almost like marketing or something like that. Well, it's, it's manifested <clears throat> in different ways. It's it's just about image. Now they call it brand. You know what I mean? I have to develop yeah. my brand. I'm like, dude, you don't have a brand. You just made a sex tape and you got a reality TV show after that. And now <laughs> they just slap your name on yeah. bullshit cosmetics, you know? So yeah. that's the way of the world now. But not really too dissimilar to the things like this where it was like, well, <clears throat> there are a few bands that had some talent that had some success that had a specific look. Can we just replicate that and churn out some carbon copies of that? And people will eat it up anyways, you know, and what's your gimmick, you know? So unfortunately that happens and it happens a lot. Um, usually, you know, that shit gets sifts out though. You know, it's, it, it, it'll, essentially you're not going to last in the industry if you don't have talent you know um paris hilton just, had a very successful music career huh paris, paris hilton, hilton had well, you a know very successful funny. music career <laughs> that that scene where harold ramis comes in as, as chris moore he opens it up and he's like you guys are the hottest thing since marky mark in the funky bunch and um you know and then rex is like marky mark man that guy sucks so <laughs> What's funny about that scene is that Marky Mark very quickly like shed that image of himself, but that dude's still around. And we yeah. talked about earlier how hard it is to be relevant in Hollywood. You know what I mean? He crossed over, he made it, but he realized, look, I got to get rid of this like underwear thing and, 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 you know, 
did he have talent you know as a rapper i don't know i mean i like that one track but i mean it's more to like nostalgic 80 you know 90s yeah, yeah, dance yeah. tunes but um good vibrations but um yeah. you know i it, it's funny that that was he's he's called out by name in there clearly because they felt like he was a hot item at the time but the dude stood the test of time because he was able to sort of shed that bullshit image and let his talent show you know and that's what you need to have that staying power absolutely and i think like the modern music industry has really redefined the concept of selling your soul to the devil so oh, yeah. you know the origins of that term is Robert Johnson at the crossroads, he goes and meets the devil, he sells his soul, so he gets these skills to play the guitar. But now selling your soul is not for the skills, you're selling your soul for the limelight. So whether that's you're whoring yourself out through a sex tape or whatever, you're you're just you're just selling yourself to tr try to get fame. It's the celebrity that people are looking for. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. and and like the theme throughout this is this movie is like being real, being rock and roll, being authentic, having these musicians in here that are authentic. And uh, like you said, if, you, if you're if you not authentic, eventually people are going to smell it on you. Right. And sometimes the fans aren't authentic either. So right, right. you have a band that's going out there and they're like, oh, we're a rock band. We're called Imagine Dragons or something. <laughs> and it's like, to me, that's not a rock band. Right. They're, a, they're a pop band. They're successful. Their fans like it. But I guarantee you there's some Imagine Dragon fans that are like rock, rock and roll, oh, you know, like this is you my freak rock out and roll. When people do this when they give you like the, I love you symbol. Like, I love you the, too. The devil horns. <laughs> I'm like, really? Have you not, have you not been paying attention? There's a way to sell people things that they want that are fake because then they think that their fake thing is real. So I don't fault ban like fans who get tricked. Um, but you're going to notice a diversely different audience at an Iron Maiden concert right. than you are at whatever the other thing is that they're trying to roll out as heavy metal. Um, we, we talked about this previously, but I forget. Are you okay with people wearing metal shirts as a, as like a fashion statement? You know, like um, this right, goes in the same. One of the, this goes one in of the, you know what I mean. Wearing a motor, like Motorhead, particularly, like seems to be the yeah. thing that everybody wears. Well, here's the thing: some some people actually are metalheads, like Lady Gaga. I know, like legit metalhead used to go to metal shows. People yeah. know that, like she's wearing a metal shirt. That's cool to me because maybe she'll open up like some fourteen year old girl's eyes to right. seeing how cool Iron Maiden is or Metallica is, and they check them out. Uh, <clears throat> same way with like some rappers, they wear like Slayer shirts. Maybe that's actually going to open somebody up to like Slayer. Um, part of me doesn't care because it's not my music. Pop the pop thing, the whole scene, like it's like it's just they're just doing it because they think it looks cool uh but to answer your question yeah you should listen to the band i would never be caught dead wearing a shirt of a band that i don't listen to now how many bands though can you say that you found through seeing somebody else wear that metal shirt you know like you see a shirt and then you go check out that band right there's a couple but only because it looks uh, i see it on a dude that is that another metal show or like looks yes, legit? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. You know, I wouldn't say like if I see Jay Z wearing a metal shirt, I'm going to go check out that metal band. But the, that's the, not what I mean. The thing about metal is the community about it. Like when I, that's the best thing. Like just even recently, I saw a dude who had a hell yeah shirt on, you know, not even a shirt. It was like, it was like a button down, but it just had a subtle like hell yeah above the collar. It's kind of like a dicky work shirt, something like that. So I was like, you're metalhead, you know, and um, <laughs> next thing you know, he and I were like cornered for like an hour and a half at some restaurant. You know what I mean? My buddy's looking at me. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, dude, I'm talking metal, man. You know, so it's like a calling card, right? Well, it is, you know, and it's a very unique club and it's a distinct thing. And um, I value and cherish that little like. That's just something that's only <laughs> like, does that happen? With any other music genre, does that happen anywhere? You know. So, well, anyway, I'm, I'm gonna I tell. Digress. I'm gonna tell a really heartwarming tale right now. All right. This is this is a story called when Baxter met Kenneth, 
And... <laughs> okay. We uh, so so we we both uh, we we became friends because we worked for a company together, a fairly large company. Mm -hmm. Um, Ken on the side of sales and myself on the creative direction side. So we're in Vegas for a big corporate event, like uh, trade I don't know show. what you call it, trade trade show mm -hmm. event that we're we're actually we have a booth for. Um, so I'm I'm part of the team that's actually designing and putting together the booth. Ken's on the team. It's going to be selling that booth the next day. So all these I, our companies had merged. So Ken and I had not worked together before. Uh, so he's there with a bunch of other people. And the big thing for me was that previously all the sales reps I worked with were like old, like they were like middle aged or older. And so when we merged, all of a sudden there's like young blood, like all these young guys from Dallas come in and stuff like that. And they're, uh, you know, they all seem pretty hip. Like I see this hip guy, you know, I'm checking Ken out, you know, and <laughs> now, but the point is that the, I don't know these guys from Adam. I don't know these guys at all. I'm presenting to them, whatever, you know. Um, Ken had some good points about like making sure you're not looking at people's badges. You look at them in the eye, blah, blah, blah. So after we're done with this training session of going around the booth and explaining all these displays we designed, we go to an Irish pub in Vegas. We go to the Irish pub and we're hanging out. And again, I don't, I don't know these folks very well. I'm just getting to know them rubbing elbows. And I see this guy that it was at the presentation which is Ken and he's over at the bar and he's talking to these women. And I, and I'm thinking like, what, what a loser. Like he's over there using his corporate card to buy these women drinks. Like what is going on? Um, Cause I don't know Ken at this point. Well, it turns out that it's actually a customer. And, and, and after that he introduces me to the customer to me uh, because we're going to work together potentially with this customer. It was in a, um, a vertical that I had already been designing it. So I happen to have all these examples for this customer. The good part of the story is not this. It has nothing to do with the customer. It has nothing to do with the designs on my phone. But it happens to be that the fact that then I find out that Ken is a fellow metalhead. <laughs> <laughs> and like you just said, Ken, it wasn't an hour and a half of talking to metal. Right. It was like it was like 48 hours of talking right. metal and not sleeping and having a blast in Vegas. And um now we metal, do a dude. metal podcast. <laughs> I don't know if you would tell the story any differently, but that's my perception of like and it all comes down to heavy metal. Like if, if, if we didn't have that like connection there, you would, you, when you're all dressed up, we're both wearing suit coats and like nice clothes. Like, you, like you said, it's like going into Kuma's dress nice. Like right. you don't have that like calling card to be like, Oh yeah, I belong here. We're the same people. I don't even know how we got on the topic of metal because we weren't like wearing shirts. We were wearing like our work gear at the time. So sure. Um, I just think it's just in our common discussion points about ourselves, getting to know people where it just comes out. We're like, like, what do you do? You're like, oh, yeah, I mean, I live in California. I'm originally from Jersey, blah, 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 blah. I listen to metal. I'm all metal all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's, that's the way that it is. Yeah. It's just a part of like the, the, the three or four bullet points that like, if you have to sum up about yourself, I'm like, yep, it's in there. It's always in there. It's in, it's in your DNA. It's, uh, it's, uh, and, and, and go, 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 go ahead. Check your mic again there. Uh -huh. uh, okay. <clears throat> but anyways, we digress. So we should, <laughs> we should stop rolling out on our metal history and move on. I think. All right. I'm back. Okay. Audio. Uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing I would say real quick is um, just like this movie, you meet somebody and you, they say they're a metalhead, right away it's like, they're probably not. <laughs> they're probably not. They're probably into like Nickelback or something and they claim <laughs> metal and, you know, and it's maybe that's like a very elitist attitude to have. It's mm -hmm. probably not the best, healthiest attitude to have. But the point is you can you can see through people 
you can tell if if they're not i mean if a dude walks up in a full print obituary t-shirt or a full print slayer t-shirt i love that in the movie again talking about all the references of, mm -hmm. of of different things from uh from the 90s that like are very reminiscent that's mm -hmm. one scene the guy with the big boom box and the obituary t-shirt you know and that's what it comes down to you know you and i validated each other's authenticity in the metal scene, you know, that's, and it's, there's always that test, you know? So, uh, well, and it's and they could, all those little nuggets, all those stickers that you're talking about. That's in, um, uh, Carter's Carter. office, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it could, they could have just made up fake bands, you know, like mm -hmm. skull banger and, flamethrower. Like they mm -hmm. could just had like these weird fake band names and you, they get their point across, but, when you have an actual band, you have an obituary shirt. Like mm -hmm. that's like, oh, we're we we know what we're talking about. This is this is this is getting real. Um, and and just to extend off of that is just the presence of all these real life musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, Lemmy's got the cameo obviously at the end of the movie, which is which. There's other little subtle nods, like when Chaz is hanging out in his apartment. Just like we would be hanging out watching MTV, he's watching Aerosmith on on the TV, which is actually the Galactic Cowboys performing. Mm -hmm. They're performing mm -hmm. at the Whiskey in the Rainbow Room. I've been to um, a couple venues in LA. Um, you know, I, I live in NorCal, so I've been everywhere up here. And when I, I've I've been to some some places down there, but the Whiskey hasn't been. I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, I've been down on the Sunset Strip. I've been at the rainbow room um you know checked out places but not seen any shows or live mm -hmm. performances just it's just cool it feels like you're you're like almost at a museum you mm -hmm. know this is this is music la's definitely got a, a weight to it you know what i mean there's there's a history there and you can feel it when you go in those venues um obviously we talked about beavis and butthead being in this and they're just as important as the live musicians that are in this mm -hmm. uh kurt loader Another, uh, you know, I know that's one of your faves. Well, I mean, better than Ricky Rockman, maybe? <laughs> Would Ricky Rockman have yeah, like, a better choice to have? If there's, if there's a real I mean, band thing going on, you want MTV News there. That was like a big deal, right? For like, sure. yeah. How did you get your news about music? Like, Dude, Kurt Loder was the voice of a generation, man. I mean, that guy, you know, I remember Kurt Loder telling us that, like, Cobain had killed himself, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like in his like somber delivery that he gives, you know, it was pretty powerful, you know. You can't deny that these are guys that, you know, sort of soundtrack certain areas of your life, certain times of your life, you know. Well, and music magazines weren't on the internet at you right. know, they were they were you would have to wait for them to be printed. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you got a lot of interesting stuff, whether it was tidbits about a new album coming out or, mm -hmm. or like you said, deaths or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, White Zombie performing, uh, which to me is like the most important part about the the soundtrack of this film. Um, the, that song itself uh, went on to chart on the Billboard 200 and it peaked at number 157. Right. So that was pretty <clears throat> cool. And like I we were talking a little bit. I, I thought maybe it was on a different White Zombie album. But no, that was single was specifically for this movie, which mm -hmm. which back then in that era, there, there was there was a lot of that happening. Like people would write tracks specifically for album soundtracks. Yeah, that was a thing that happened in the nineties a lot. And even earlier than that, um, it seems to be dying art, but there was, I mean, there's a ton of movies that like the marketing, like the, the movie wouldn't be the same without that, without that song in it or without that soundtrack. You know I mean? I, I mean, you can rattle off a million, but like, like think about, think about Top Gun without Danger Zone. Dude. Sure. Think sure. About, rocky without eye of the tiger you know to me this soundtrack though as much as this movie is about music and as much as i love white zombie being the live band in this this soundtrack to me is a little bit of a disappointment not even a little bit i think it is a disappointment <laughs> i i like it it wouldn't it wouldn't be in my like top 10 soundtracks right 
Um, but like, I would bring up the point that like born to raise hell, which is like how the movie starts motorhead and ice T like, that's kind of the eye of the tiger of this movie. Okay, um, so you've that in the zombie tune. Those are like the best tracks on this album. After that, the rest of it, you could throw out the anthrax cover of London is good. What now, relevance to anything does it have in the movie? It's in the movie. You know, I, 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 I correspond a lot of it to like, these are songs that show up in the movie. Um, you know, prime is like, it's more, I think more about the bands themselves than maybe the material. So prong prong is an awesome band. Is the song that great? It's probably not the best prong song. Primus yeah, you know, is it best Primus song. Probably not, but I think, I think good. I think good movies that have good soundtracks incorporate that song into the scene you know sure. um, singles does a really good job of doing that yeah, oh uh, absolutely you know yeah. at, um <clears throat> movies like forrest gump which is very much about the time you know when he's jumping through all these times and the music is indicative of what's happening at that time telling the social story telling the you know the significance of the culture at that time they could have done this for airheads particularly this i mean the premise of this movie is metalheads taking over radio and they're telling this sort of you know there's this subtext that's happening here they could have really knocked it out of the park instead for whatever reason i feel like they mailed in this movie i don't i don't know why they thought afterwards they didn't they didn't market it very well it, it didn't it bombed in the airways they didn't they didn't advertise it this soundtrack feels sure. very last minute to me and it even feels like if you listen to them with well, these songs in the movie when they're like dancing and jumping around it's not synced up correctly like they're <laughs> they're banging their heads to like it's off it's not the right tempo you know so clearly these songs were not were like the cheap ones they got or the afterthought or i don't know what that what happened there, what, that's even true but that's sort of how it looks to me here the best song on the soundtrack hands down to me is uh the last song on the soundtrack the ramones we want the airwaves um right. which is is like a perfect song for the movie itself so maybe that right. should have been the first song on the on the soundtrack but i get what they were doing trying to bring in you know ice t is huge at this point in 94 a very mm -hmm. big figure motorhead again like if anything this brought motorhead into the social consciousness mm -hmm. like if you're if you're um just like a movie fan going to see this movie like you're like oh yeah i remember that band motorhead like i bet you that like kind of elevated them in a way to bring them back to the forefront um i feel like motorhead if anything got bigger towards the end of their career right and you know they finally started getting the accolades and the credit for what they they did i will give airhead soundtrack credit for involvement of lemmy and motorhead in all aspects of this movie that's the thing that they did and you're right i think the ramones you want the airwaves is probably a good choice for again the story that they're telling here um and the zombie one because that was the band that they showcased in the um uh, in the movie itself, not their first choice, by the way, they tried to get cannibal corpse before that. They tried to yep. get Metallica before that. Um, I guess cannibal corpse was already like in, um, ace, ace, uh, pet, pet detective. Yeah. Metallica yeah. Just flat out refused, but you know, clearly something's happening when they couldn't get the things that they wanted is the rest of the songs because, of licensing of royalties of whatever i don't know but to me it just doesn't feel like a properly put together like they the the, the songs don't don't relay the story of that um don't don't relate to the story in a way that it, it, it could have been much better i think that's my sort of my my takeaway from the whole thing yeah i think they kind of picked a little bit more like digestible choices right. like for especially like nowadays they may go a little bit harder because like we were talking about Metallica is now played on the radio. So right, right. back then maybe they were trying to make a soundtrack that was a little bit more holistically accepted. Um, well, there was a lot of soundtracks that were coming out that time that were like heavy too, though, sure. you know? So I don't necessarily buy that. I just think it was just, they just 
failed. They just failed at this task. And they could have done a better job specifically because this movie is <laughs> about music and it's about metal. And none of these, none of the stuff is really that heavy. If you look at it, like Motorhead's the heaviest and then they don't even do like the original version of it. Like it's, you know, Primus's version is like a remastered version. It's kind of weird, you know, nothing on here is heavy. And this is a movie about, you know, metal. Heads. We get it. We get it, Ken. You want heavy music. Yeah. All right. You want heavy, you want heavy music. Just making making sure you did get it. <laughs> All right, so hit me hit me with some uh, soundtracks that that are meeting your heavy requirements and that you think rock. Uh, the two the two soundtracks that I had on repeat, you know, twenty some odd years ago, Judgment Night, not the greatest movie, way better soundtrack than movie, and Last Action Hero. Great movie, great soundtrack. You know, I, I had a feeling you were going to pick Judgment Night. I think yeah. I'm a little young for that soundtrack, right. but like mm -hmm. everyone I know that loves heavy music, whether they're into hardcore or they're into metal, always says Judgment Night. And there's a pretty big significance because of all the mashups, right? Right. I mean, it, it, Judgment Night did what, you know, had happened very little at that point. It, it crossed over metal and rap. You know, up until that point, you had... Walk This Way with Run DMC and Aerosmith. Yep. And you had Bring the Noise with Anthrax and Public Enemy. Um, Run DMC really, I think, was the first, you know, big rap group that embraced rock sound in it. They had a lot of guitar playing in it. So it made sense that they were on this CD and they did crossover with Living Color, which is a great song. But the rest of the mashups, when this came out, we were like, holy shit, they got some bands on here that shook hands and did like, I mean, Slayer and Ice-T. Now it makes sense because Ice-T, apparently career metalhead, you know, career love of metal made Body Count. I don't think Body Count was out at this time or maybe it just come out. But then they got Biohazard and Onyx. They got... Helmet and House of Pain, which were both huge 90s acts. Um, I really like the uh, Booyah Tribe, Faith No More track. Dude, the Booyah Tribe and Faith No More might be the best song on the album, man. It's great. Um, great. Another Body Murdered. So diverse collaboration, great original sound, uh, great original songwriting, great, great soundtrack, and something that stands alone. Like you don't have to even watch a movie. You just throw the CD in. You're like, dude, what do you listen to? Killer. Killer. So that I wish they did stuff like that now, you know? Yeah. Uh, they don't. I don't know. It's like a thing where like they I feel like they don't they don't pay attention to soundtracks anymore and they don't like make cool movie posters anymore, man. I don't see like art associated with the movie that I want to like wear as a shirt, you know, um, very little, you know, uh, but. The, that particular one, yeah, I might be, you know, choosing the sexy answer with everybody else, but I mean, it's it's that answer for a reason. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, there's a reason why people pick it. Yeah, yeah, and then the second one is Last Action Hero, which strictly because it's got like two original Alice in Chain songs that are not on um, any other album. Um, and then the rest of the tracks on there are like, um, all, it's just a great collaboration, ACDC, um, Megadeth, so on and so forth. Even like the Queensryche and Def Leppard songs on there are great. And I think the Queensryche is an original track just for this. <laughs> Def but, Leppard song, man, come on. <laughs> it's not bad, dude. It's not bad. <laughs> but What the Hell Have I and A Little Bitter by, uh, Oh Al yeah, so King. good. Those songs are great, dude. And when we, when, when we saw them in, um in uh, milwaukee together well, he played one of those i forget i think he played yeah i forget which one so um you know i i think uh angry again is uh that was a huge radio single like great. i remember yeah. them playing that all the time and i i i feel like you forget about a lot of these like one-offs for these albums kind of like feed the gods for airheads with mm -hmm. white zombie like mm -hmm. the difference there is there's that just that one song really Whereas on this, you've got multiple songs from multiple artists that don't show up anywhere else. Mm -hmm. 
So they show up on their like compilation albums down the road where they put together these singles. But back in the day, if you wanted that song, if you wanted Feed the Gods, if you wanted Angry Again, you had to buy the soundtrack. You had to buy the CD, dude. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, all right. What about you? What do you? What's your What's your soundtrack, son? Uh, so mine are uh, the Spawn the movie soundtrack as well as the Bride of Chucky soundtrack. Very heavy. Spawn's very heavy. Um, both pretty metal. Um, the Spawn soundtrack though is kind of like the second coming of the Judgment Night soundtrack, yes. where they're they're strictly straight up collaborations. Um, you've got Kirk Hammett. Crystal Method, Slayer with Atari Teenage Riot, Corn, mm-hmm. Manson, Silver Chair. Like it was all metal acts paired up with electronic music artists. So it just kind of amped up the intensity on all of those tracks. Um, and what I enjoyed about soundtracks back in the day is like you would have a soundtrack in your rotation with your like 10 albums you're listening to, just like it was a regular band's album. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like you, you, you had your CD wallet and that was in there and mm-hmm. you put that on and it's got a nice mix. Um, Bride of Chucky. Uh, <laughs> like when I look at the list of bands on that alone, like these are all my favorite bands. That. It's Judas Priest, White Zombie, Typo Negative, Monster Magnet, Static X, Bruce Dickinson and Slayer. Like if, if I wasn't already listening to those bands, they <clears throat> definitely introduced me to those. Are bands. those tracks that they pulled off of pre-existing albums or were those originals written for, originally for the movie? Uh, a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. So some of them were off of older albums that were out. Um, sometimes uh, they were, I think they were all album tracks, but like it would be an album that just came out or was about to come out. Okay. Um, like the Bruce Dickinson track trumpets of Jericho that was on chemical wedding, which had just come out. So, you know what, what I do then is I go and I buy that album, which is kind of the, kind of the The goal there. Uh, Um, It's the promotion, right? They had a phrase on that, on the outside of that album, which was so common with soundtracks, which, uh, was music from and inspired by the motion picture. Mm. So you'd have a lot of tracks that were not even in the movie. Right. That but, that actually happened a lot, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so sometimes you'd get that placement of like, oh, there's a typo negative song for 30 seconds in the scene. Yeah. <laughs> or like Primus in uh Airheads, even. You you don't really notice it, but it's playing when the cops are outside and you I didn't notice it actually. When I listened to that album, I was like, When did they play this song? I never even caught it. I just to me it just that it just didn't fit right, but Crystal they're, they're, pointed it like, out I, to I, me. So some movies just sort of um, they overlap the music and the scene just so well. Um, soundtracks, though, man, they were that was a huge part. You, you know, there's there are some movies that those soundtracks still hold up. Um, I listened like I mean, when I was in college, we would put soundtracks on as like the playlist for the party. Sure. Uh, um, Forrest Gump was like a two CD track that was like. Yep you know, spanned the fifties and sixties was great uh, or sixties and seventies. Um, and it was great. Uh, you know, like age of Aquarius and, um, but Pulp Fiction reservoir dogs, dude, uh, we put reservoir dogs and, um, when Steelers wheel would come on, man, stuck in the middle with you, the party would go off. That was, that was it, man. It went off. Everybody would dancing for that song. And that was, so that was like, Heavy in the rotation every Saturday night. Every time we had a kegger, dude, Reservoir Dog soundtrack was going on. Well, the the nice thing about the Reservoir Dog soundtrack too is it it has such a nice flow. You've got Stephen Wright, who is a stand up comedian, very dry oh, humor, man. but he's doing this like classic like sixties, I would say like sixties seventies radio DJ thing. So right. he's actually like like DJing a soundtrack from a movie and it it gives it it just a whole other kind of experience kill bill is another good tarantino soundtrack where you've got some good yeah tarantino really focuses on music man yeah Yeah, tarantino scorsese like we were watching goodfellas the other night and it's just like you could just the music selection is so important Mm -hmm. and and as a music fan i find myself then going down the rabbit hole of of like going and finding all the Morricone music because of Tarantino. Mm-hmm. And now I'm spending, you know, four hours at work just listening to soundtracks of of spaghetti westerns because 
this is great textural right. music right. Um, that you might not have found. And, and I find whenever I, I know Tarantino gets excited about sharing those hidden gems with people mm -hmm. and it makes the scene. And, and then I get excited to do the same because somehow now I'm the one that can share this rare jazz musician with somebody. Um, so there's a lot to be uh, gained from that. Mm-hmm. Um, one that one that was like a non-metal soundtrack for me would have been uh, the Romeo and Juliet, the Baz Luhrmann Romeo and Juliet soundtrack. That's a very good one. Yeah, yeah. A, and uh, and Tiff plays the Garden State soundtrack like all the time. Sure. I'm like, where? Well, I always and, and I and I catch myself all the time. I'm like, this is a good song. What is this? And she's like, oh, it's so and so. I'm like, why do you? Ha I'm like, oh, it's why would you have this? And she's like, oh, it's on the Garden State soundtrack. I'm like, oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So there's lots of good honorable mention, honorable mentions in there. You know, I mean, um, but it, sometimes it doesn't even need to be like the full out. Like, all, you need. There's a lot of one hit wonders that come out of there too. Too. I mean, think about like uh, I will always love you uh, from yeah. the Bodyguard, <clears throat> and uh, my heart will go on titanic i mean there's the all those that it was like it was hand in hand they played those songs got so much radio play at the same time that that movie was blowing up the box office and it was like a very deliberate like marketing ploy like we're gonna pick a great song and it's gonna be a great movie and or hopefully i mean but, but ghostbusters dude the ghostbusters theme ray parker jr Ray, Ray Parker Jr.'s greatest hits album looks like the Ghostbusters art. Like <laughs> That's it. he has made a career. He got sued for that song. Oh, really? Because he ripped off New Drug by Huey Lewis and the News. I didn't know that. Yeah. So he I think there was a settlement. Yeah, because of that. But just the Ghostbusters <laughs> theme song ripped off. The Ghostbusters theme song. Listen to that back to back with Got a New Drug. All right. All right. And uh yeah, like it I gotta do that. I didn't I've never been down that wormhole. So But yeah, um, just say that like a single from a movie soundtrack is what you make your greatest hits album look like because you've had so much success and made right. so much boatloads right. of money off of that. Sometimes um, all you gotta do is just do one thing in your life, man. Yep. That's um it. it's just finding that one thing. Right. <laughs> Um, another, you know, talking about the radio play of soundtracks, Disney, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I remember growing up, every kid's movie had like the, the version that was in the movie that was like the character singing it. Yeah. And then you had some famous celebrity like Elton John singing the song on the radio. And, you know, they had the two different versions and the radio version would be played in every department store, every grocery store, every what's that, just, what's that, what's that song? Um, the Lego song. Oh, everything is awesome. Everything is awesome. You know, I mean, those, those movies, like those animated movies, they do a, that's very deliberate. They do, they do it better than anybody else. They write songs for movies, hook the kids, hook the movie, cross merchandise. That shit's like so perfectly thought out. I mean, brilliant. Yep. I mean, my son, I mean, they cross gender. I mean, my son, like, last year he just listened to frozen the entire year if it wasn't frozen it was cars you know so they got it they got it dialed in dude you know um one more soundtrack that came to mind that i've always loved is uh the darjeeling limited soundtrack um i don't know what that is wes anderson film oh, very okay. excellent film um but the soundtrack is like awesome it's got ravi shankar on it it's got the rolling stones it's like weird when you find yourself listening to these artists that you're familiar with but you uh you never really explored their catalog so right. you have some some really uh some really odd song by um i'm trying to think of who who's all on that but there's just a very big mix of bands and mm -hmm. you hear these songs and then he's like oh i'm gonna listen to this band that was from 1968 this album that i probably wouldn't have listened to that because i only know this band for these songs and i mm -hmm. don't know it from these rarities um but soundtracks dying art and i think partially it's because of streaming um yeah right so what you can't so spotify does not have album soundtracks on it right no like 
fans can put together a playlist and they can curate all the songs, but not all the songs are on there. And I I think it's because if you have a specific song from a specific soundtrack, you would have to have it like licensed through that label and through that team. And if they didn't put it online, it's not going to be available. That's a good point. Maybe the band doesn't own it. Like the movie company owns it. Yeah. Uh, Or like whoever was distributing it at the time. Got it. Got it. So, like, if it's a smaller record label that might have distribu- distributed the song, uh, they might not put that up there. They might pay to get an album up there, but they might not pay to get some random single off of the Airhead soundtrack mm. online. So it kind of it kind of breaks up the whole thing because, like I said before, you put on an album, you listen to Forrest Gump from the front to the back. You don't you don't put it on for track four. You put it on for the entire album. And then you hear all these things that you weren't really planning on listening to in between. Um, but on it's Spotify, good thing I now, kept all my CDs. Then did you keep all your CDs? Uh, I've got them in storage. Right, me too. Well, that's I, have, I, I actually them. have somewhere. I have. I ordered on uh, eBay the Airhead soundtrack because <laughs> I I had it <laughs> way back in the that? day. But like i like we said you can't get it on spotify they have a song called fuel but it's metallica's fuel which is not the song that's on the soundtrack right they just sometimes they just sub songs to make it the best Mm -hmm. sometimes they add songs that weren't even on the soundtrack Right. right so uh there's just something special about the package right we talk about albums it's the package it's the art of the movie it's the notes it's the (laughs) what did airheads what did airheads soundtrack on ebay cost you I think I had for 15. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was still it was still in the cellophane. So yeah. some guys got a warehouse full of them somewhere, dude. It's kind of like buying toys that are from the 80s and actually opening them. Like mm-hmm. I don't open everything that's old, but like some of that stuff, you get it and it's still in that package and you open it and you have that same feeling that you had, you know, in 1987 when you opened that thing. Right. Um, it's un unblemished from the world so you know as we as as we kind of start to close out this conversation um we should just talk about like so what what is the legacy of this movie like why why is it why does it have this cult status yeah and why is it significant in 2021 well i think it's it's two things one's unintentional and then the other one's intentional the unintentional thing is they caught lightning in a bottle and they casted all these people at an early age who became huge movie stars later on, you know, add in a couple of big names like Harold Ramis and Michael McKean and, you know, um, vets like Joe Montana and you got success right there. They caught lightning yeah. in a bottle there. That's why it's cult first and foremost is because you see Chris Farley, like in his second movie, you know, um, and the other point too is the 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 subject of this podcast. You know what I mean? It is authentic. It is a '90s time capsule. It does tell a story of the music industry. Um, it does have some detail in there that you can sift through and find that is legitimate. It does put Lemmy on a pedestal. You know what I mean? It, yeah, it does, yeah. It does hit some some pretty legit topics for like true to rock true rock fans that's kind of what i think it is i don't think it's all that super deep you know what i mean sure yeah i think that you know if i was gonna write a movie um i'd probably get too cerebral you know what i mean maybe yeah it, yeah it'd be probably hard to write slapstick because i'd probably want to have too many double entendres and too much hidden text subtext. But I think that's, I think that's the reason why it holds up and it has a legacy that it does. I mean, what what do you think? You think it's got more to it than that? Uh, Yeah. I mean, I think like you said, I think the basis of this podcast is taking things that are authentically us Mm -hmm. that have influenced us that we've lived through that, that we have autobiographical context for. Um. And with that being said, I think first and foremost, it's a time capsule. It's right. a time capsule of 1994. We can look back fondly and nostalgically on that time. And like, you know, that's not on purpose. It's really just because that was the time. 
they did things the best they could to make it authentic. Um, so sometimes things look silly for, you know, things go from looking silly to looking fondly mm -hmm. back on them. You know, you look back on them and you're like, oh, that hair's silly. And now you're looking, oh man, that hair's pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> because enough time now has passed. 27 years have passed and you're like, man, that was the time to be alive. <laughs> we we but, didn't talk um, about, that reminds me, we talk about Buscemi's hair looks real to me. Rex's hair looks real to me. Chaz's hair looks like extensions to me. What do you think? Um, I was thinking about the same thing as I was watching because I'm always yeah. thinking like, do you think he had real hair? Here's what I would say. Encino Man, that's probably Brennan Fraser's real hair. So okay. it's it could be his real hair if he would have just, if he continued to let it grow. Right. Um, I or definitely think enough, though, his hair is real though. You could put extensions in it though. That's true. Yeah. You'd look pretty good actually with those kind of extensions. Dude. <sighs> just in the back. <sighs> I've told you my mullet stories, dude, right? It was like my mullet was so glorious. It was like a squirrel was sitting on my shoulder and its tail would come out. Do you ever hear of people like veterans who have phantom limbs, like when their arm gets cut off, but it's still like it itches? Sure. Sometimes when I ride my motorcycle, the way that the wind whips off the back of my helmet it feels like my mullet is flapping in the wind. I have like the phantom limb mullet. True story. Anyways. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't even know where to go from there. I, I think that's the close, I, actually. I, I, mean, I don't really know how you go. You build. I'd say in the time, <laughs> the times of Zoom calls is now the time for you to bring back the Kentucky waterfall. Like. <laughs> I, I debated. I actually tried to grow my hair out. Um, I, I I was late. I should have started last March when this shit started. But it thanks Thanksgiving rolled around last year, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to grow it out. So I let it go for like a month and a half, um, right before Thanksgiving to like right before Christmas. And it got long enough and like thick enough where it was like starting to come over my ear. And I couldn't I couldn't handle it, dude. Like the, the OCD in me, like I just freaked out, and I just like, hit the shaver, the razor again. And that was it. And I was done. That's where I was at with the beard. I was yeah. like, I just can't take it. It's yeah. it. I, and I had shaved. I, I trimmed it, but I hadn't shaved since before Christmas and it's fun to play, play around with it. But I'm like, I need to be me again. Right. Um, right. But yeah, I, I, I think in closing, uh, like kind of the way I started off this podcast is if you've ever been in a band, or you've ever wanted to be in a band, or you like bands, this is definitely a movie for you to check out. It's fun. It's a fun right. movie. It's right. not that cerebral. We 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 made it cerebral <laughs> in our in our breakdown of the in our over connotations of it. <laughs> um, but you know that's what we do. That's what we do right. on this podcast. Right. Is that's what we, do. we we turn little things into big things. Um, the authenticity, though the 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 rock stars in it, all those things. Um, I think are are what make the movie what it is. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I will say, and Chaz said it the best, and I think that your mullet said it the best. I am rock and roll. That's right. All right, folks, it's time for our final segment of the podcast, The Firing Squad. <laughs> In this segment, I will be asking our guests 10 quick fire questions. Ken hasn't seen this list of questions prior to me asking them, so his answers should be quick and simple with no explanation needed. Ken, I know it's been a minute, but are you ready? Yeah, I like this section. I can't do it, so let's do it. Yeah, I know you hate all the other all the I other do, uh, segments. So. I don't like being uncomfortable. Those other ones make me uncomfortable. <laughs> That's how I come up with them. I'm like, what will Ken hate the most? <laughs> These I'm comfortable with. That's fine. All right, number one. Mm -hmm. What was the last concert you attended? I think it was Aftershock. Um, big festival in Sacramento. Tool Headlines. They played um, the first the first new songs off the new album. I, oh yeah. yeah yeah and um you know a shit ton of other bands are playing uh but i think that was the last i think that was the last one it's been a while yeah all right uh favorite stephen king novel 
Oof. Um, geez. That's, I mean, there's a ton. I mean, I just, I just finished the unabridged stand, um, which I like, uh, the ending is not as good as I remembered it, but, um, the dark half, Christine, those are up there for me. All right. All right. Uh, number three, favorite Dio era Sabbath song. I'm probably going to stick with the OG and just go heaven and hell. It's hard to beat, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. That's, that's how also because that was the one that like won me over too, you know? So, um, and I was a late bloomer to the Dio era, you know? Really? Um, yeah. But that's, I hate to, it's, it's the, again, it's like the cliche answer, but fucking I, it's a good, it's a good one. So. I'm glad you didn't open with that in Vegas where you were like, right. yeah, it was late to Dio era. I'm sure. Right. Um, and we might not be sitting here today. Um, number four, <laughs> uh, favorite pizza, the restaurant and toppings. Uh, well, I'm a Jersey boy. And actually, you've been there with me, so you can speak to this. My favorite pizza is from Mawa, New Jersey. It's called Kinchley's. It's a thin crust, which is not your typical like Jersey, New York slice. Yeah. Um, but it's 15 minutes from where I grew up. Um, I like it just plain cheese or, you know, sausage, mushrooms, pepperoni, any combo, though. Sort of the classics. Yeah. But sure. that's 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 my vote, man. I, yeah, I still think about that pizza. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. we uh we went there before uh misfits, misfits. Mm -hmm. yeah all right uh number five your favorite childhood show that you're sharing with your son gi joe gi joe that's a real american hero right mm -hmm. there number six favorite thing you are currently streaming slash binging that would be unexpected to our listeners so Oh. I don't really believe in like the guilty pleasure, but like, what's the weird thing that you might be watching? <clears throat> Gilmore Girls. I um. Well, I actually just finished this. Um. I like these. Uh. I like these reality ch shows. This one I just watched is called Blown Away, and it's about glass blowers. It's a competition. It's kind of like Ink Master for glass blowers, and I didn't think I'd like it. But then I was like, why didn't I think I'd like it? It's super cool. They're artists competing different like glass blowing challenge challenges. Yeah. I loved it. There was two seasons. I just finished it. There's that one. I'm going to give you two answers. And my other one is another British show, reality show called um, The Repair Shop. And it's a museum. It's a repair shop in a museum in England somewhere. And people bring their like they're antique artifacts that are broken and they have all of these like master craftsmen who repair it. Some do like um, furniture repair. Others do like broken ceramic repair. Others do um, like uh, painting, you know, stitch up paintings that have holes in it and stuff like that. But, and all, all of the craftsmen are so super talented. It's amazing. And they're real people. That show, and, and I love both of those. I love those like art reality shows like that. Sure, so, yeah. Um, and it's not guilty pleasure at all. I will proudly um, talk about those. Yeah, when you said British, I thought uh, Crystal and I have been watching the Great British Baking Show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really a fan of those cooking shows for whatever. Yo, I, I, I'm not either. I don't right. like cooking shows uh, right. because like, I don't like watching something and I can't eat it. Right. Like I can't no. partake in what they're making. So it's like, I got to make sure I'm eating something. Otherwise I'm like dying. Mm -hmm. But uh, the great British baking show, I actually really enjoy. It's so relaxing. All right. It's I'll not give it like, shot. it's not like a Gordon Ramsay where they're, right. he's yelling at people and it's stressful. They're like so polite and like, it's calm and they're outdoors and like, I, I don't know. I didn't think I would like it. I didn't. I didn't start watching it. Crystal was watching it, and I got sucked in. I was that like, "Sounds oh, like man, something I is... can digest." The cooking shows are so over the top with the personality yeah. and the, you know what I mean. And like, uh, get rid of the pomp and circumstance. Just cook something and move on. I I know? agree. I agree one hundred percent. Yeah. All right. So number seven, your favorite music venue, like anywhere in the world that you've been. <sighs> 
You know, um, well, I've lived in San Francisco for the past decade before I moved up to the Burbs here. And I like this little club called Slims because it was like you could get up close and personal and see people. Yeah. Um, but as like an East Coast guy, originally, like when you saw your band at MSG, you know, from like an arena perspective, that was when, you know, like you were seeing an event, you know, like the band knew they were playing MSG. So to them, it was like the pinnacle and you were going to MSG and the energy yeah. in New York and the taking the subway to get there and drinking in the bars around the garden. And I watched the Rangers there and, you know, like it's, I, I, I like that for that reason, which is a totally different, but I like little clubs in San Francisco, like slams and shit like that. So, but I'll put yeah, MSG I, at the top. I've been to MSG. Uh, I saw UFC there. So mm -hmm. Um, just being in like this legendary fight venue and sporting venue and music yeah. venue, like, yeah, just three, you know, it's heavy. Yeah. You just feel like you are in this legendary place. It's yeah. quite amazing. Um, so what, what's a, what's a better franchise child's play or saw? Saw. I, I, I would agree. I like both, but mm -hmm. Uh, number nine, favorite Star Wars hero. Well, it depends on what your definition of hero is, but I'm going to go with the anti-hero. Darth Vader is the best. <laughs> what? All time. How, how is he a hero? Because it's well, a story it's... of a man's love for his son. That's what it is. It's a family story. And the power of love... Huey, speaking of Huey Lewis in the news, that's he's the hero, right? Re, re, you know, I mean, a Return of the Jedi. That's what it's all about, man. Yeah, I mean, the only part where I would say he's a hero is when he literally throws the Emperor, throws the Emperor down. Emperor. Yeah, so you yeah, can't yeah, say he's not yeah, the yeah. hero. Yeah, so that's to me. I mean, and and my son, my son used to say that Luke was his favorite character. Now he's come around and he says that Vader's his favorite character. So he gets it, you know. But it's it's I'm interested to see how that plays out with the new Obi Wan series because Homeboy's coming back as Anakin. Um, I'm excited I'm about the Dis I'm I'm very I'm very excited about Disney's takeover of Star Wars because they're cranking out content and now on yeah. Disney Plus. After what Mandalorian did, um, I'm excited to see where the future is going. Because the, the movies, I'm like, eh, whatever. You know, some of them were good. Some of them were okay. You know, there's there's a lot you can talk about. But the Mandalorian really righted the ship. So I'm excited about the future. Yeah, they're kind of giving different content for different types of people for right. Star Wars. So right. it's like if you're into, like, animated stuff, you've got this. If you're into, like, more purist stuff, you've got the Mandalorian. And it's a little more edgy, you know. Mm -hmm. Um so, yeah, I'm excited as well. Okay, uh, tenth question, final question: mm -hmm. What concert are you most looking forward to seeing post pandemic? Doesn't have to be something scheduled, um, but like something that you know is going to happen. You know, it's sort of embarrassing. You said I don't really have. I didn't have any tickets purchased. Well, no, that's not true. I had tool tickets purchased. I mean. It doesn't have to be something you have tickets for. It could be like, yeah, oh, no, I know. I, I'm trying to think of like, you know, <clears throat> I, you know, Ryan, I, I couldn't even tell you right now. I would just like to go out and like have a cheeseburger out in public. You know, I'll take anything. Um, you know, when, when we started going back into like the, the 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 nostalgia tour, there's like, I, I kind of want to see some bands like, like Maiden and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, that uh, <clears throat> there was uh, there was a Motley. I think it was was it Motley Crue and Poison were going to tour together or something. And I'm like, yeah. I wanted to see that show because I had never seen either of them. So even though I knew it probably wouldn't be the best time to see them, like considering their age, but um, I'm kind of in the place right now. I'm like, I want to see some old bands before their time is up. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So. I don't have an answer for you right now because um, I'll take whatever I could get, to be honest with you. But I think what I'm going to do is like see the bands that 
just lost a year and a half of their life or potentially two years that before this is over that we might not yeah. see again. So I'm going to kick off with nostalgia tours, you know, maybe like last reunion tours or whatever is, is like potentially maybe one of the few, few of their tours remaining. That's, that's probably where I'm going to go. Yeah. I feel like the bands that I actually saw most recently before the pandemic they fall in that category. And I, mm -hmm. and I'm like, so because of the pandemic and not being able to see anything, I'm chomping at the bit to go see kiss again, right. to see scorpions again, mm -hmm. or to see, um, white snake again, uh, Ozzy, like Ozzy's like right at the end of the career there. Like I would love to see Ozzy again. Um, Nate and I had Roger Waters tickets, like, mm -hmm. and the first time we saw Roger Waters, I was excited, but I wasn't that excited. But then when I saw the show, it like blew my mind. And I'm like, I got to do this again before he's not touring anymore. Right. So right. like you said, like bands just lost a year and a half of time. They, when this is all said and done, they're going to have lost like two years of touring. So like Kiss, who was on their farewell tour, was supposed to be done. Like we we're we we're discussing, like, how do we get tickets to the final? It's Madison Square Garden is going to be their final show. So it's like, how do we how do we wrangle those tickets? And now they got probably another leg to do before they even get to that. Dude, I, I was just watching this little mini documentary on Pantera the other day, and they were going through all of their, you know, Anselmo versus Dimebag argument thing that sort of broke the band up. But then 9-11 9 9 occurred, and then that was like nothing happened for a while. And then after that, like damage plan was created and Dime got yeah. shot. There are things that happen that will like break apart bands, you know. COVID definitely is going to be the end of some bands. We're not going to be able to see them because we lost these two years. It is absolutely a truth, especially yeah. for the bands that we listened to growing up that are no longer going are capable of touring because of age or relationship or, you know, what death or whatever it is. So yep. there's going to be bands like that where we look back in a couple of years and be like, dude, we didn't, we missed, we missed seeing that because of fucking COVID, you know, that's going to be an answer. That's going to be very real. So if I can, if I see a tour that comes out and I realize that, Hey, this is our last chance. That's the first one I'm signing up for, you know? Absolutely. Well, and we got to get we got to get back on the horse of our annual trip right, too. Right. you know, so yeah. there's so many options and there's going to be things that are announced that like before they would have been exciting, but they'll be even more exciting now, yeah. you know, yeah. like with all the circumstances. All right, folks, before we get out of here, um, where can we check out Sculpable Ken? Yeah, right now, uh, don't, don't go to Etsy. Just go to Instagram. <laughs> uh, Sculpable, S-K-U-L-L-P-A-B-L-E. Um, nothing new up there recently, but I hope to get kickstarted soon and have some new stuff up there. Um, but uh, this was fun, brother. I really miss doing this, man. It's good to see your face and chat about overanalyzing metal again like we always do absolutely um everyone out there in youtube land and podcast land um remember this episode was streamed live on youtube where you can replay it from now until forever um also the following monday it'll be on all major podcast platforms so spotify apple podcast app overcast anchor pocket casts um also make sure you're checking out collect and destroy.com that's collect x destroy.com um, for the just the general uh, website, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and then also check out the shop, which is at shop.collectanddestroy.com, right collectxdestroy.com. Uh, if you go on there, enter the promo code podcast15 at checkout, you can get 15% off. So, nice. Um, you? Again, podcast15 at checkout. <clears throat> Ken, sincerely, thank you so much for being a part of this podcast. No, brother. Uh, everyone stay safe out there. We'll catch you on our next podcast when we sit down with Nate Failour to talk about thrash metal uh, and all things anthrax. And oh. uh, I think we're going to try to, you know, loop you into that too, Ken. You can come on, do a little guest spot. We'll talk some stormtroopers of death. And Three-headed dragon coming your way. Such. <laughs>